or they're about to compete for the biggest game of their season. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fine as we, uh, for lack of a better word, we are taking a cruise this weekend, Brian. You, you want to know why I use that analogy? Uh, please, share with me because I'm, I'm, I'm landlocked. I'm stuck on land. You tell me. Because we got some teams on the ship. They are playing for the ship, the championship that is. Okay. All right. All right. I got what you did there. I see what you did. Um, and what we're talking about in the Division Two level, we're talking about it's the SIAC and the CIAA championship games. In the SIAC, of course, you've got the matchup, the rematch from a year ago between Miles College Golden Bears and the Albany State Golden Rams. And then in the CIAA, you have another rematch with uh, the Bowie State Bulldogs, uh, the champions of a year ago, hosting or playing against the Fayetteville State Broncos. The Broncos having made their third consecutive uh, CIAA championship, and they are looking still for their first win since, I believe, 2009. I think is what I I read. Uh, So... Uh, we've we've come to the end of the regular season for many of the other teams in the uh, Division Two. The only team that is sitting at home on a bye, so to speak, with their season not quite finished, is Virginia State. And I, I think AD, we, we'll start there before we kind of get into our rundown. And uh, I, I mentioned Virginia State because, as you so eloquently wrote in your most recent column, um, it's Virginia State right now that is really sitting at home after beating Virginia Union 27-24 in that unbelievable overtime uh, field goal, a fake field goal that turned into just an incomplete throw. Um, you know, Virginia State – is now sitting currently in the number seven seed spot after the third week of the NCAA rankings. But they have, uh, you know, some challenges ahead of them. So, A.D., break that down for us based on, you know, what we've seen, what we know, and what you expect to happen. All right. Let's do a little bit of a recall here, Brian. Uh, Last week, Virginia State was sitting in the number seven slot also, and Virginia Union was sitting in the number eight slot. We knew, obviously, somebody was going to win, somebody was going to lose. You would have thought that the winner of a seven versus eight match would move to number six, Reason I said we thought they were going to move to number six, you had West Florida, who was sitting in the number six slot, playing the uh, number one Valdosta State at the excuse me number two at that point in time, Valdosta State Blazers. So Valdosta State defeated West Florida. So what do you think what do you think would happen under normal circumstances, Brian? Uh 
Seven wins, six loses. Both of them are top ten matchups. You, um, you would think I, number – Yeah. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean – um, I would think that the team that won with the team that lost in front of them would move up a spot. I guess that's it, right? Ex- yes, yes. So you would think seven would move to six, six would drop to seven, possibly eight, because of the because of the defeat. But the pulses were not so kind to Virginia State. Virginia State remained at number seven, and West Florida remained at number six, despite the loss. So was excuse me. So Virginia State was not rewarded with uh with points because of their victory. You may wonder why that's important, Brian. And without getting long winded, I will tell you exactly why that is important. As you know, only the top seven teams make it to the playoffs. So you think Virginia State is in, correct, Brian? Well, um, I think they are in a good standing, possibly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to do my, my best Lee Corso impersonation. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> uh, the two, a couple of things uh, hurt this Virginia State team. Number one, they are idle this week. Everybody else in the top ten has one additional opportunity to impress the pollsters. And we know what happens to teams that are idle, Brian. Pollsters tend to forget about them. That's number one. Number two, slipping into the polls this week in the number eight slot is going to be Delta State. You may wonder – what does the number eight Delta State have to do with anything? Well, Delta State has the best RPI of the teams in the top ten. So that that RPI is almost uh, 100 points better than Virginia Virginia State's RPI. They play another team that is just outside outside of the top ten and a team that was rated in the top ten earlier this week, excuse me, earlier this season in Mississippi College. A victory against Mississippi College will not only bolster Delta State's RPI, it will probably be enough to flip flop Virginia State and Mississippi College. But we're still not done yet, Brian. Oh no, not done yet, huh? Okay. Not done yet, and I'm trying and I'm trying to wrap this up as fast as I can. <laughs> Sitting in the number nine spot it are the Albany State Golden Rams, who are the only HBCU with an RPI over five hundred. First of all, you may wonder what RPI is, Brian. I know you know the average person doesn't know. It's basically strength of schedule. To get deeper into it, please read my article that is posted on the my BCSN website. Please read that article. It goes into it deeper into depth and what and the theory behind some of the stuff that I'm talking about. But as as a conference champion, you can finish as low as number nine in the in the top ten poll and still re- receive an automatic bid. Why Why is that important? How does that hurt Virginia uh, State? Virginia State is sitting at number seven. If number if you get in as number eight or number nine with the automatic bid, you bump out the lowest team in the poll. Who is the lowest team in the poll right now, Brian, that, that qualifies? Virginia State. So Virginia State has three strikes against them right now. They're idle this week. They have a team with a better RPI. They have a team with a better RPI behind them. Actually, two teams with a better RPI directly behind them, with another opportunity to play. And one of those two teams has the potential to win the conference championship. Going to be tough for Virginia State to get in. They're going to they're going to need some help. They're going to need some teams to lose. Real simple, Brian. And that's the that's the kind of breakdown that you're not getting from anywhere else. Right there from 
the the maestro of D2 football, A.D. Drew, with a beautiful breakdown. I mean, you know, definitely after, after I, I feel, I don't know how I feel. I feel a little twisted. I thought what was interesting about your column is sort of your prediction, which we'll get into maybe a little bit later here. I won't spoil it, but if people haven't list or haven't read it yet, but I would encourage you to go to mybcsn.net, uh, go to our post or news, and there you will see the column. It's the third week, so it'll say uh, Division Two. Mm, what is that? Division Two rankings or Division Two uh, predictions for Week Three? Uh, or after week three, something of that nature. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough spot for Virginia State to be in, and unfortunately it is what it is. And um, there's not much they can do except sort of like you said, A.D., just kind of sit back and watch and hope some some games bounce their way. Can I, can I, can I throw one more, one more curveball in there for Yeah, uh, you Virginia can. One, oh, one more curveball. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. One, one more cur- curveball. What happens to Virginia State if Fayetteville upsets Bowie this weekend? Because you know who the number 10 team in the poll is, Brian? Uh, no. No, who is number 10? That, that would be the Fayetteville State Broncos. Fayetteville State may be the second CIAA team in if they upset Bowie. With them sitting at number 10, and at a conference championship, they would probably bump up to a minimum of nine, if not eight. So if I'm hearing they you right, up, you, you think that ahead. we could see a uh, – so you think Fayetteville State and Bowie could end up in in this, if Fayetteville it, State beats Bowie? Yes, because Bowie will not drop out. Win or lose, Bowie is going to the playoffs. Bowie is playing for a home game this weekend. Bowie wins, they're at home first round. Mm -hmm. Bowie loses, they travel. Fayetteville State beating a top three team, the number three team, in Bowie. If Fayetteville State does not move from the 10 slot up, up at least one point for knocking off the number three team, Brian, all the HBCUs just need to pull out of the NCAA polls because they, they there's nothing but bias, if, in, in my opinion, if that does not happen. Here, here's the curveball for that. A Fayetteville State upset victory could cost the SIAC because – if it, Fayetteville State upsets Bowie, Bowie gets in, Fayetteville State goes up to nine, they may bump back that SIAC team, which is currently Albany State. There's a lot of different things that could happen this weekend, Brian. Yeah, I'm just sitting here shaking my head, uh, trying to wrap my, my mind around the fact that we have these championship games and then we have these scenarios going on after. So for... For fans, uh, all I can really encourage you to do is to watch your game, watch your team, and, and, and read my them... article and see. And, and, and as, as the game is going on, read my article and see the different scenarios that I play out and how your how your team could be affected and how right or how wrong I am. And a majority of what I have written over the last two weeks has been correct, Brian. Well, okay. <laughs> well, a- again, good, uh, good stuff in AD. I, I mean, that's really, um, you know, pro- props to you, props to you for for coming up with uh, this uh, this column and really taking us on the deep dive through the through the playoffs. And I guess after today or after the games, all we'll do is kind of sit back and watch the selection show and kind of see. See how it all falls, right? That's all we yes, can sir. do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all we can do. Okay, and so hope let's that the do the right thing. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and set the sort of uh, layout for this particular championship edition. We will be heavily focused 
on the Division II, CIAA, and SIAC in this podcast. We will probably do something where we talk about some of the other games going on in FCS, um, as there are some interesting MEAC and SWAC related games for us to definitely talk about. Um, what we can, let's set that up. Okay, so we're, we're going to basically, as we said, we're going to start in SIC. So we're talking Miles versus Albany State. We'll talk a little bit about the season for both of them uh, that brought them back to this era or to this weekend, excuse me. Then AD had an opportunity to in, have an interview with head coach Damon Wilson of uh, Bowie State. And, uh, you know, the the Bulldogs are 10-0, and 0, which is a school record, um, a regular season record, on the verge of going 11-0. Uh, the, the debate uh, as to whether Bowie State can be – the, the HBCU national champion has already begun, and it gets closer and closer. These next two weeks, obviously, you know, Bowie State is the front. They, I, I would say they are they're sort of neck and neck with Florida A&M, who is uh, sitting right now at 8-1, eight uh, eight-game winning streak. The Rattlers are number one in just every, about everybody's poll. Uh, of course, anybody who has a – Split poll has Bowie State in that poll. Uh, yeah. What were you going to say, AD? A slip up by FAMU over the next two weeks pretty much opens the door for Bowie State to become the Black College National Champion in just about every poll that does a combined poll, Brian. Yeah, and and we meant to slip up. It's a it's a it's a realistic. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a slip up. I would just say. They have, I mean, Howard should not be a much of a contest, but, you know, think about what happened Bethune. to North Carolina A&T and Bethune-Cookman playing as uh, double-digit favorites on the road, think about, and they both lose outright. Think, think about what happened last year with FAMU. You went to Howard. Yes, yes, exactly. And then, then of course, FAMU has their rival game against Bethune-Cookman, and they have not fared well against Bethune. So, uh, as the events of Bethune versus North Carolina A&T play out this weekend, it will definitely have an effect on the following week. So, like I said, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff. But uh, And then, and then uh, so after we have the interview with Damon Wilson, we will go into sort of breaking down the game, the matchup, you know, the offenses and defenses, and then we will – go into a prediction. We'll look at the uh, versus sports simulation of the game, and then we'll also give our own prediction. So we'll kind of do that for the SIAC. You were going to add something, A.D.? Uh, you, you keep referencing Damon Wilson. Damon Wilson's at Bowie State. Uh, the interview with Reginald Ruffin, who's Miles head coach, is the SIAC interview. Thank you, thank you. I, I apologize for that. Yeah, uh, so that'll be it'll be re- well. You know what you know what's throwing me off is on my note sheet. I, my first notes are the CIAA, and then on page two of my notes is <laughs> Miles and Reginald Ruffin. So I guess I should I would have thought about that had I been on that page. So, but anyway, that that same format that I just kind of threw out there for folks will be what we go with you know, when it's time to talk. Uh, as I said, we're starting in the SIEC, so our first conversation will be Reginald Ruffin of Miles. And then later on in the second half of the show, we get to the CIAA and talk with Damon Wilson of Bowie State during the CIAA segment. All right. All that said, let's go through the review of the past season for each school, Albany State and Miles. Um, so, A.D., Albany State, let's start there. Uh, started the year, overall, their record is 7-3, and three, uh, finished 5-1 and one in the conference. They essentially had a stumbling, they stumbled out the gate, essentially losing 38-3 to three to Valdosta State, the defending, defending national champs. Uh, then they also lost by a touchdown to Mississippi College. 
uh, team you just mentioned. I, just curious, had they beat Mississippi College, what might they be looking like right now? Had, what will Albany State look like? Had they, had they done, had they beat Mississippi College in, back in week uh, two or three? Based on the strength of schedule and some of the other things that I've seen, because uh, the Gulf South is a power conference, they would have gone two and zero against Gulf South opponents. Uh, Albany State did defeat West Georgia l- later on. Matter of fact, the week the after week. they lost to Mississippi College, right. uh, so they would have gone two and zero against the Gulf South Conference which would have done two things. Number one, it would have boosted the rating of the SIAC with those two victories and would probably have Albany State uh, in, the t- in the top five based, based, on their, uh, based on their record. Yeah, so interesting how one game, uh, the effect of yeah. one game. So as, as AD mentioned. And, and kudos. I was going to say kudos for Albany State for sending up what I like to call a championship schedule to build up a championship resume because their three non-conference games were in region, uh, in region games, Valdosta State, Mississippi College, and West Georgia, and the pollsters have rewarded Albany State for that, for that schedule. Yeah, um, and they were on the road. Well, actually, they hosted Valdosta State at home to open the season, and then and then they actually went on the road for the Mississippi College and the University of West Georgia contest. Um, yeah, and so after that, Albany State essentially gets into playing SIAC opponent, and they would go on a four-game winning streak. The West Georgia game would actually be the first of five straight wins for Albany State. Yeah, they'd beat Clark Atlanta, Tuskegee, Lane, and Benedict College. Of course, Benedict score was the amazingly low 7-2. and two. And so that five-game winning streak and a 5-2 and two record is what Albany State, you know, in a late October matchup, in Savannah, Georgia, uh, a game that really was for supremacy of the SIAC East, although, you know, of course, we know Savannah State could not technically play for the championship. Uh, They still had implications. They still had an effect on the outcome of what was to come. Uh, Albany State would actually lose to Savannah State, and then uh, Albany State would turn around for the final game of the season and beat Morehouse 21-15. Uh, last two games of the season, they beat Morehouse 21-15 and Fort Valley State, which we talked about as the SIAC East Championship game, and they pretty much uh, wally, you know, just walloped Fort Valley State 42-6. to Of course, that Fort Valley State team, a uh, missing Slade Jarman who – for the first probably seven weeks of the season, eight weeks even, was probably one of the best quarterbacks in D2 Black College football. Um, so, A.D., as you look at this schedule for Albany State, what are your thoughts? Any, any additional thoughts other than what you shared earlier? Nine of the ten games that Albany State played this year, Brian, were in the state of Georgia. The only time they had to travel outside of the state was when they went to Mississippi College and lost. Just an interesting sidebar. Uh, so their fans have had the opportunity to be well engaged with this Albany State Golden Rams team on on this year, Brian. So uh, you know that just an interesting stat. It pro- means nothing going into this game except for the fact that this game is in the state of Georgia on their own home turf there in Doherty County and just something to just something to keep in mind as we get down to the predictions. Okay. We'll do that. The have, the, the championship game is being hosted 
at Albany State University Coliseum. So that's a big plus for Albany State, as, of course, last year they had to travel to Miles for this championship game. This year it's in their backyard. Um, well, you sounded like you were going to say something there, A.D., were you? I was going to say they went 72 within the state, Brian. I was going to put that out there also. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's move over to Miles. Miles Golden Bears coming into this contest with a record of 8-2, and 5-1 and one in the conference. Uh, they have won two games in a row after the tough loss to Central State. And so for Miles, you know, I, I thought their season started out really well with the win at Fort Valley State, and then they played Morehouse. Um, and on the road was their first true test where they played Missouri S&T. And they lost to them 49-21. to what are your thoughts? Had had Miles won that game, what might be, uh, you know, what what might we be saying, Miles? Had they won that game? Uh, that game, I actually, Brian, had no bearing on their ranking as a Division Two opponent because although it was a Division Two game, it was a non-region Division Two. Division two game. The NCAA wants these teams to play within their region. So that wow, game, win or, win or lose, did not affect Miles as far as their rankings go. And Miles is being punished uh, for, for that, Brian. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, following following that uh, game against Missouri S and T, Miles would go on a streak against some SIC opponents. Uh, let's see: Lane College, Clark Atlanta, Benedict, all wins. And so you've got a at that point a six and one Miles coming in or traveling on the road up to Wilberforce, Ohio. And I'm, I'm just looking here. That Central State loss came on October 26th, and they rebounded from that and got an impressive 17-0 shutout against Virginia State and then a 20-6 victory uh, over Tuskegee in what we called the SIAC West. Any, any final thoughts there, A.D., on, on Miles and their season? A miles in that season? <laughs> uh, just just, uh, just just real just real interesting there, uh, Brian. You know, Miles has been a great uh, a good team, but they have not done the best on the road. Both of their losses this season have come on the road. Just keep that in mind as we get into the prediction portions, Brian. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back from that, uh, we get right back into the breakdowns uh, of uh, some of the the key statistics that we feel will will help you help us determine who's going to win this CIAA or excuse me this SIAC championship game. All right, so we'll take a break, and coming back, you will hear right here on the BCSN Sports Wrap. This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC, champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. 
In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. The Black College Sports Network is proud to partner with ComputerRatings.com. That's C-O-M-P-U-G-H-T-E-R Ratings.com for the upcoming college football season. ComputerRatings.com delivers rankings, game predictions, and statistics for hundreds of professional and collegiate teams. The key feature of ComputerRatings.com is the Versus Sports Simulator, which allows users to simulate any possible matchup and view the predicted scores along with a side-by-side stats analysis. Improve your odds by signing up for a subscription. Monthly, semi-yearly, and yearly subscriptions are available. For our listeners and viewers, use the promo code BCSN19 and get 15% off of your subscription at checkout. Visit www.computerratings.com. That's C-O-M-P-U-G-H-T-E-R ratings.com hello and welcome back to the bcsn sports wrap brian fulford here and ad drew so now uh, we're, we're in that point where we're going to break down offenses and defensive sides of the ball uh ad will he he's got albany state i've got miles we'll also get into just the notable key players that you will most likely hear names called that you want to pay attention to because these are the guys that we expect to have impact. So we're going to start Albany State offense. Uh, that's UAD versus Miles defense. Albany State has one of the top rushing offenses in the conference, ranking number three with 217 yards per game, ranking only behind Kentucky State and Savannah State, two teams that we know that rush the ball tremendously, uh, Brian. Um, they say it's not a great, great passing team. Um, you know, the, you would think with their rushing that they would be have a great advantage on time of possession, but they don't. They're at 29 minutes and, and some change uh, with their – with the time of possession of that, Brian. So, uh, you know, ex- ex- expect a lot of rushing the ball from from Albany State. One thing with Albany State, they are the, the, the good on fourth downs, Brian. They're, they're 414 this particular – excuse me, they're not good on fourth downs, Brian. Uh, Brian, they rank last in the conference on fourth down conversions, only converting two of 12 on fourth down this particular year, Brian. So uh, it's going to be essential that Albany State score and and move the chains when they have the opportunity to. One last key stat, Brian, in the red zone, Albany State has scored in 19 of 23 possessions in the red zone for an 82.6% clip. Uh, and, you know, what's interesting, A.D., and I'll, I'll start there as you talked about the red zone offense for Albany State. I'll talk about Miles' red zone defense, which ranks as the best red zone defense in the SIAC. They've actually uh, – they've only they've only been in the red zone defensively 33 times uh, and have only given up 22 scores. Now, that's a rate of 66.7%. Uh, I didn't. I failed to break down whether that's touchdowns or field goals uh, exactly. But you mentioned that's a that's an interesting angle there. When Albany State, if Albany State gets into the red zone, the fact that uh, they've been there 23 times and are and are scoring 82.6 percent, that's impressive. Now you mentioned Albany State's run defense. Well, that I think is one of the key factors in this game because they're going up against the number one rushing defense in the league. 
by by the metrics of rushing defense yards per play. Now, I, just in terms of total yards per game, Miles is only allowing 81.1 yards per game rushing, which is number one in the conference. I think the next team closest is something like mid-90s and then another team at 100. So they are literally 20 yards less than uh, – Ten of the other nine schools in the uh, – I should say that the other way. Nine of the other ten schools in the conference. Uh, their rushing defense yards per play, they're only giving up 2.8. So counter that with Albany State, who's averaging 5.5 rushing yards per play to Miles only allowing 2.8. I think that's a very key stat that will have to be paid attention to because the one thing that Albany State does well, that is what Miles stops. I don't think Albany State is much of a threat to a passing, uh, to pass the ball. Miles has one of the better pass defenses. So, you know, all of the numbers that, you know, show Miles' pass defense, I mean, they've had 11 interceptions this year. If you were going to attack Miles, personally, I think you have to do it through the air. Um, I I don't see that being a strength of Albany State. Um, just glancing here in terms of total defense, Miles is number two, sitting right behind Albany State. So, uh, you know, actually there's some 40 yards per game behind. But but again, go to another key stat: yards per play. Uh, um, Miles giving up 4.8 total yards per play defensively compared to Albany State, who's only given up 4.1 yards per play. And I think that's that's really uh, the, the key uh, average that I think really needs to be paid attention to. Uh, one final stat that I'll bring up as it relates to Miles' defense, Miles has 40 sacks. That is number one in the SIAC. So when Albany State does drop back to pass, they got to be careful because all uh, Miles, they get pressure on the quarterback, and if the offensive line is not holding strong, you will get you will get blitzed by Miles. And uh, the, if you if you're not paying attention, it, we've seen Miles play, so it could happen at, at the most inopportune time. And so that's what Albany State is going to have to pay attention to. But again, Miles with 40 sacks, clear by far the number one uh, sack team in the SIC and they lead the league in interceptions with 11. So that that's two uh, stats that I thought I'd bring up on miles defensively. So let's talk about those key players that we mentioned AD. Um, you want me to start with, I'll start with the defensive guys and then jump over to you with, with the offensive guys. That'll work, Brian. Okay. So on the defensive side of the ball for miles, the key guy that you're going to have to look out for, who should be all over the field, sophomore linebacker Mitchell Smiley, uh, 69. Uh, excuse me, he's 66 total tackles in the conference. 35 of them were solo. Five sacks, which uh, puts him number six. The sacks number number six overall in the conference. Uh, the 66 total tackles, number nine in the conference. Also, Smiley has 12 tackles for loss, which puts him at number eight in the conference. So Mitchell Smiley, a young linebacker, a name that I'm sure we'll hear. It's interesting because coming into the beginning of the season, linebacker Austin Stevens, who was the preseason defensive player of the year, was the name we heard. But I don't know if it was just injuries or uh, the, the improvements from the other linebackers. Uh, Mitchell Smiley being one of them, uh, Incontavious Floyd being another name that has really stepped up this year. My, Austin Stevens isn't having to do all the work. So for the senior linebacker, he's still there. He still could cause issues. Uh, he's only had 47 tackles this year, two sacks. Uh, this is probably a, a more complete Miles defense. In terms of sacks, up front, it's junior defensive lineman Markel Shelton and senior defensive lineman Jalen Thomas. Those two rank fifth and sixth in the conference in total sacks. Shelton has 5.5 on the year, and Jalen Thomas at 4.5. 
Also, um, when you think about uh, tackles for loss, Jalen Thomas has 10.5. So he, along with Smiley and Floyd, all sitting there with about 10.5 to 12 tackles for lost. Um, we talked about interceptions, and the last thing I'll mention, this is a great pass defense. Um, Jarius Gr uh, Grayson, uh, pay attention for him. He's a freshman defensive back. Uh, in terms of passes defended, he is number two in the conference with a total of 11. And then interceptions. How about Incontavious Floyd, who has three interceptions this year as a linebacker. He is the only player to have taken them to the house for touchdowns twice. Uh, so he leads the conference not only in, uh, in, in well, not only, but in, in interceptions returned. So that's a little bit about the Miles defense. What about Albany State's offense? Who are those players to watch, A.D.? Miles defense will have to focus on McKinley Habersham. He's averaging 75 yards per game on the ground. And also they will have to focus on Tracy Scott, his teammate back there in the backfield, who's putting up 68.3 yards per game. So did we know this is a rush-happy offense? So those are the two players that Miles will have to focus on when they are running the ball. When they drop back to pass the ball, you have to focus on none other than Kalias Williams, who has a quarterback rating of 118.8, but is only completing 50% of his passes. He has thrown three picks on the season along with, with five touchdowns. When he decides to put the ball in the air, his, his number one target is Michael Green, who's averaging 28 yards per game, so uh, he's averaging one, one and a half catches per game, so once again, we know Albany State is a run-happy team, so the big focus is going to be is that line going to block like it needs to block? The good old law firm of Habersham and Scott. I mean, that's what the, that's what you'll be, be dealing with, uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure Coach Ruffin has uh, has has turned the tape on those two guys, and uh, that that's going to be the key for Miles. All right, let's switch it over here. Let's go Miles' offense versus Albany State's defense, and I guess I'll go first with uh, with talking about Miles' offense. They, in terms of total offense, 370.7 yards per game. Overall, they have a yard per play average of 5.4, which is number three in uh, in the conference. And so that'll be uh, – they're going up against a tough test. They've got a tough uh, test this upcoming week. But um, Miles is scoring 31 points a game, which is number two. In the conference, uh, one of the one of the best scoring offenses, and they're and they you know what's amazing is they don't do it one dimensionally. I mean, statistically in the SIC, you'll see Fayette, Fort Valley State, excuse me, and Clark as the two uh, in terms of offensive yards, passing yards, scoring. Those are the two that sit near the top, but obviously we understand where their season is. But Miles is pretty complete on all sides of the ball. I mean, they scored 41 touchdowns this year. The rushing yards per game is 195.1, uh, which is number four in the conference. And their rushing yards per play is 4.5, which is number one in the, uh, in, in the conference. So, uh, you know, passing the ball, uh, Daniel Smith, uh, passing the ball, the uh, let's see, an average of 175.6 yards per game. They've only passed the ball for 250 attempts, and I say that only because, again, there are some teams in this conference that are throwing the ball much more than Miles is. But impressively, Miles passing offensive yards per play is at 7.02, which is fourth best, you know, in the conference. Um, the passing percentage, 56%. And on third down, look, the third down numbers aren't great, 
they are third best in the conference at 37.31%. I thought what was interesting, you brought up red zone offense for Albany State. Miles' red zone offense is only uh, converting at a 78.3% clip in the red zone. But listen to this key stat. Albany State, you mentioned AD, had been in the red zone 23 times. Miles has been in the red zone twice as much, 46 times. And they have scored twice as much. They scored 36 times of 46. So even though, you know, the, on average, you, when you look at percentage, Miles is number six in the conference. They lead the league in red zone trips and red zone scores. So sometimes the completion or the percentages can be a little deceiving, especially when the frequency is there. What about Albany State's defense? Where's the matchup going to be against Miles, A.D.? The number one defense in the conference, both in points allowed and yards per game, is the Albany State Golden Rams. They have, they're only giving up 16 points per game on defense, and 245 yards total defense. When Miles decides to put the ball in the air, Albany State Golden Rams has the number one pass defense in the conference, narrowly eclipsing Tuskegee. They're giving up 141.4 yards per game in in the air. So uh, Albany State's Pass defense is one of the top notch defenses. Red zone, Brian. Let's let's get it, let's get into this red zone defense. You mentioned uh, earlier about Miles's red zone offense and what they're doing on the red zone offense. There are only two defenses in this conference who allow less than seventy percent scores in the red zone. You mentioned Miles. In the, pre- in the previous uh, segment, the only other team that's given up less than 70% of the scores on defense in the red zone is Albany State. Teams have gotten to the red zone 26 times on them, have, have scored 18 times, Brian. But here's the interesting thing with that particular, with that particular stat. Only 16 touchdowns, Brian. Only 16 touchdowns have been scored against the team in the red zone. That's the second fewest allowed in the conference, Brian. Only 16 of them. So, uh, you know, Miles is going to have to score on big plays. They're not going to be able to punch it in and have long, sustained drive looking at this over the state's red zone defense, Brian. No, it does. It does sound like that. That's going to be one of those key matchups, and seeing how and what happens in the red zone. Why don't you go ahead and talk about the offensive players for Albany State, and then I will follow up with the key excuse, that's defensive that's defensive yeah. players. Yeah, for the defensive players for Albany State, and then I'll talk offensive players for Miles. The two people who lead this team in tackles are going to be Tyler Scott and. Coimba Jones, both Scott uh, lead the team with 49 tackles, Jones with 43 tackles. Uh, when you talk about tackles for loss, that's getting to the backfield, wreaking havoc on the opposing teams. That's going to be Deontay Jackson and Derek Davis, both with eight tackles for loss this particular season. Also for Davis, he leads the teams in sacks with four on the season. So those are going to be your uh, some of your key players for uh, for the Golden Rams. Looking, looking at the uh, secondary, Brian, Scott, Tyler Scott, Quimba Jones, and Jayla Bush, all three of them have two interceptions on the season for the Golden Rams. They are the matter of fact, they are the only three people on the Golden Rams defense with interceptions. So make sure make sure you stay away from these defensive backs right there, Brian. <laughs> um <clears throat> for uh, Miles offensively 
Daniel Smith, the uh, returning quarterback who helped lead them to the championship last year, uh, he is fourth in total offense in the SIEC with 100, or excuse me, 1,507 passing yards, only 85 rushing yards. Curious, his rushing numbers definitely are down from a year ago, but that's a good thing, and I'll, and I'll sort of explain why in a moment. Uh, he's had 13 touchdowns, nine interceptions this year passing. He's averaging 159.2 yards per game. Uh, his lead receiver this year, Leonard Tyree, 24 catches, 488 yards, three touchdowns. He leads uh, the wide receiver in core, uh, averaging 48.8 per game in terms of yards per game. And the average per catch is at about 20.3. Now, I mentioned the fact that Daniel Smith, offensively, his numbers, his rushing numbers are down. If you go back and look from a year ago, well, that's because there are primarily three strong running backs that Miles leans on. And it starts with Justin Ruiz, who is actually number eight in the conference in terms of uh, yards, uh, yardage average. And, you know, he's only carried the ball 97 times. Well, actually, it's a good mix between Justin Ruiz, Dante Edwards, and Wade Streeter. Um, Dante Edwards has 99 attempts this year in 10 games. Ruiz, 97 attempts in nine games. And Streeter has 91 attempts in nine games. So it's pretty balanced among those three. Uh, Edwards has 573 net yards. Ruiz, 549. And Streeter, 490. So you can see if you put those three guys together, you've got somebody who's uh, one rushing. you got a running back that is probably running – what, uh, almost 300 carries for 1,500 yards and a total of 14 touchdowns. If you did it among two, you probably have almost a 1,000-yard rusher in just a less than 200 yards or 200 attempts. Either way you do it, it just makes it uh, that much more um, – what's the word I'm looking for, that much more efficient when you have three strong running backs. And they're all, they're all rushing at an average per carry, uh, 5.8 for Edwards, 5.7 for Ruiz, and 5.4 for Streeter. And as I mentioned, 14 touchdowns among all three guys. And that, that's, what, that's where Miles' running game is coming from. And so – of course, the, the fourth option in that, they'll probably go with a guy like Daniel Smith, um, who, you know, obviously is the quarterback. He has the ability to run if he needs to. And, and so that's where Miles is going to attack, uh, attack uh, Albany State as they've attacked everybody this year. Uh, we have a special teams. Now, we put, we put this section in here because we know sometimes the X factor in a game can be special teams. It might be the punting. It might be the field goal kicking. It might be the return game. So any number of these positions or units might make a difference and be that uh, what they call that third factor that makes a difference in this game. I'll start with Miles AD because there's not really much in terms of field goal kicking. Um, you know, they're, they've got two guys who have kicked for them this year, but, but neither one of them, I mean, has really kicked more than 10 field goals, uh, 10 field goal attempts this year. Uh, combined, the two kickers are 8 of 10. So, I, and, and, you know, I, I'll just leave it at that. Um, neither neither uh, has kicked longer than a 50-yard field goal. I, if I had to look at the numbers uh, that I was looking at earlier, they're probably within the range uh, special teams range of uh, in the in the 30 to 39 range. That's where that's where they are a perfect three for three. Uh, from 40 to 49, they're two for three. Have not kicked, attempted, or uh, taken an attempt to anything over 49 yards. So, and, but again, total field goals 10 in 10 games. But the punting. About this for a second, and what does this tell you? Miles is they have punted the ball the second fewest 
in the conference. Jay Fitch, their punter, has only punted 30 times this year, which is second fewest overall in the conference. Uh, second fewest. He averages 35.43. Uh, he's have seven punts inside the 20, two of them 50 yards plus. This offense does not punt a lot. So if Albany State is somehow able to get stops, they may force Mr. Fitch into punting way more than what he's used to on a daily basis. Again, uh, an average of three per game. So a couple of stops, some punts, maybe by the fifth or sixth punt, he might start shanking a punt or two, and that'll be an interesting development. What about Albany State? Is there anything there on the special teams unit that may make a difference in this ball game? We're just going to talk about uh, Z1 Kicker, who has uh, dual roles, Gabriel Bolinas as a punter. He's averaging 35 yards per punt, but Brian, uh, the key thing for him, he's he's down the ball 17 times inside the 20, which may be key, as we know this game will be a game of field, field position. And when it comes to his his foot between the uprights, Brian, he's 11 for 14 on these, this particular year with a long of 47 yards. Here's the one that you need to watch out for. Brian, he's 7 for 8 between 40 and 49 yards this year. Wow. That's okay. So they've got a kicker with some range. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, you're going to hear our predictions as well as what the Versus Sports Simulator uh, predicts for this contest. We'll be back right after these words on the HBCU BCSN Sports Wrap. All right. Coming back here in 15 seconds, AD. All right. And then do you want to just go right into the setup for the CIAA? Is that how we want to do that? Uh, quick break then. We, we'll do that. Also a quick break after the prediction. Yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Coming up here in 15 seconds. I do have the sports similar stuff picked up as uh, uh, uploaded. Five seconds. Right. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and AD Drew here reminding you, check us out on Twitter and Instagram at MyBCSN1, the number one. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, our BCSN and our H and our uh BCSN Sports Wrap pages are there on Facebook. Uh, on the internet, www.mybcsn.net, that's where you can also find AD's most recent article with his predictions, analysis, after the week number three D2 playoff rankings. And of course, you know, we're talking about the SIAC championship and um, you know, as we kind of talked a little bit earlier in the opening segment, AD, um, we firmly, I, I guess, we won't know. I, I guess the best, I'm going to summarize this and you and tell me if you agree or disagree. Miles Albany State really is sort of waiting to see what happens with Bowie State and Fayetteville State, meaning uh, – Miles is Miles needs to win, but they also need to see that Bowie State wins. But they're also watching everybody else. Albany State wins, but they also are watching and hoping that Bowie wins. But Albany State really has the upper leg as it as it relates to who's watching less teams. Did I summarize that appropriately? If that made sense. It 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 made sense to me because I know where you're going with that. It may not have made sense to uh, to the to the average, to the average person listening. Yeah, but, yeah, I'm afraid and, of that. But it, to sum it up in a nutshell, Albany State win. They should be in. I won't say they will be. They should be in. Miles wins. They're still going to need some help, and they're going to more than anything else. They're going to have to impress the voters with the win. They win like they won last year, 
that will impress the voters. Yeah, remember last year, Miles, 50 to 23. Um, that is one of the things hanging over this rematch. I firmly believe that it, me, if I'm a coach, I'm showing that game all week. I'm letting guys know that they whooped your tail. by They doubled you up by 27 points last year. And, I mean, you had a great season, and they knocked you essentially out of the playoffs. This year, you have an opportunity to sort of exact revenge. It's in your backyard. Even though this is a championship game, it's still basically an Albany State home game because they're playing it at Albany's uh, stadium. The versus simulator has a 73% win probability for one of these teams. And I, I keep going down to one of the key stats. We talked about Albany State's defense. Miles has a good defense. No doubt Albany State's defense um, might be considered a shade better. Averaging only giving up 16 points a game compared to Miles, which is giving up maybe uh, 20. But when you look at strength of schedule, opponent's record, 46 and 51. That's the opponent's record for Albany State. For Miles, 36 and 62. That's the opponent's uh, record. So, who, as it, as AD has pointed out, the RPI, the better RPI belongs to Albany State. Um, what could help Miles? A blowout win, similar to what they had last year. Going on the road, possibly, might impress some people. And then other people losing. That also will help. The versus simulator sees a 10-point victory in a very low-scoring game. Only 36 total points in this ball game for Miles and Albany State. And the winner they see by a score of 23 to 13 is Albany State at home. AD, I'll come to you first and say, do you agree? Who are you predicting to win the SIC championship? I disagree, Brian. I totally, uh, I totally disagree with your your statements. If I'm, but getting back to what you said. Uh, Wait a minute, you disagree with my statements, or you disagree with the computer? The computer. Okay, uh, I was going to say because it's not me. I mean, I may, I'm yeah. I'm analyzing what I see, but those numbers are coming from the computer. Right. The one thing, if I'm off the state, I showed the first half. All the state was in the game at halftime and tried to duplicate what you did in the first half. Don't even worry about showing the second half when they whoop your tail because you don't need to remember that if you're, if you're Albany State. But the one thing you've got to remember, Brian, Miles had the lead at halftime last year. They will have the lead once again at the end of the game. I see this as a three-point game, Miles 22-19. All right, AD goes miles twenty two nineteen. Um, I've been a big fan of miles all year, but I really felt this was an Albany State team that I thought would get. I'm trying to think back to very early in the year. I remember they were the Albany State was the team that I thought could could overcome and could actually beat Valdosta State. And I thought that primarily because of their defense with nine returning starters on defense. I, I honestly thought the offense would get better. I don't know if the offense necessarily got better through the course of this year. I didn't expect Miles – I don't, and I don't think Miles' offense is better than what they were last year. Um, so all that said, my final score, I'm, I, I think it will be closer than the computer predicted in terms of total points. But the outcome, I'm going to go with Albany State 24 – Miles 21. All right, so I thought that would elicit some sort of reaction from you, but nothing. So <laughs> I guess we're on. We're on we, you just let me hang there. Let me think about it. I almost changed my pick there. So thank you, AD. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> all right. So let's do this. Let's uh, let's close. We'll take a we'll take a uh, a break. Come back, and we'll begin talking. 
yeah, halftime of the, our championship show. And when we come we back, some, we'll begin talking we about some, the CIAA. We got some band music, Brian. Nope. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to drop that in post production. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. You're watching and listening to the BCSN Sports Wrap on the Black College Sports Network. Let's face it. Shopping for insurance can be time consuming. That's why when it comes to your auto, home, and life insurance needs, make things simple and trust the experts at Allstate. They will help you get the coverage that fits your needs while helping you bundle your life, home, and auto policies. Bundling saves you money, sure, but it also saves you time, so you can enjoy the things that matter most even more. Contact me, Tammy Haynes, your local agent, for a free personalized insurance quote. Allstate, are you in good hands? It's like a loot machine All around town, people trying to get down Majesty is a premium health and wellness tea line Focused on bringing delicious yet healthy tea blends to the community Filled with an abundance of vitamins and antioxidants We work to blend teas with exotic spices and fruits to produce scrumptious and wholesome beverages. So check us out at MyMajesties.com. That's M-Y-M-A-J-E-S-T-E-A-S dot com. My Majesties, an Urban Passport member. The Creole seasoning is a sodium-free and sugar-free blend that's versatile enough to put on anything. One of the first blends I developed more than eight years ago, the Creole seasoning has an unmistakable aroma, a bold flavor, and a little heat for character. Every time I open one of these bottles, I hear trumpets and big band music. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and A.D. Drew. Uh, follow us on Twitter and let us know your thoughts. Um, at uh, at my BCSN, the number one is uh, Black College Sports Network. Uh, page and then of course if you want to ind individually find Drew you can reach him at BCSN Drew uh, you can find me at DRB365 so I think uh, any any you know uh, any one of those uh, options is where you can find us of course the web page is mybcsn.net on Facebook you can find us there uh, you can also find the show uh, there on Facebook, um, uh, Black College Sports Network, and um, the uh, Sports Wrap page. All right, our friends with the Versus Sports Simulator has broken down this ball game between Albany State and Miles. And as I go through some of the superlative or some of these categories, of course, we've got the ratings. Uh, the, and the ratings are pretty much based on um, what they have done in comparison to other teams, and it really is a is a is a measuring stick within their own division. Miles is rated the higher rated team, and, and you know of all the things that I come across and say, why is Miles rated higher than? Um, or excuse me, why is Albany State rated higher than Miles? Uh, you know, when Miles has the better record, 8-2, and two, the one thing I can come back and circle is Miles, according to the versus breakdown, Miles' best win came in week number one of the season against Fort Valley State. Uh Albany State's best win came against West Georgia. You know, um, that's pretty that's pretty significant in my opinion. Um, the other things that kind of stand out in this ball game or this matchup comparison is your opponent's record, and this is why you mentioned and AD mentioned you mentioned that Albany State has an opportunity to come in into the regional rankings and stay there, you know, because they are rated higher than Miles. And it's sort of the reason why Miles, you think, has sort of low odds. Uh, opponent's record, Miles' opponents have a record of 36 and 62 this year. Um, 
Albany State's opponents have a record of 46 and 51. Uh, that is significant. I mean, that's nearly 500 from your opponents. Go ahead, AD. You sound like you were going to jump uh, in there. No, no, no. You're good. You're good right now. I do have one thing I uh, will bring up after you go through the simulator. Well, I, I was going to say, I, I was hoping you were going to say or, or, or do something and, and talk about how that and that sort of ties in with the RPI. Well, that that's basically one of the main component of uh, RPI, which is uh, your your uh, opponents' record, your opponents' records, and then the records of your opponents' opponents. So th those are the uh, those are two of the main factors that go into RPI. You've already given the record of the, of their opponents, and not only are the their opponents of uh, miles not competitive at a, what was it, you, you said, what, like 20 games below 500, 30 games below 500 there, Brian? Opponent's record for miles, yeah, 36 to 62. Yeah, almost 30 games below 500, but the the teams that they are playing are, uh, don't have uh, tremendous uh, records either. And that is due in part to the for lack of a better word, Brian, weakness of the SIAC West, as their opponents were, the SIAC West was pretty much under 500 uh, this year, Brian. Yeah, definitely. Um, you end up, a lot of these uh, schools, and you end up becoming a product of, you know, your your season and the things, you know, you become a product of your schedule. Really good, good or bad. Um, let's get into an actual prediction here from the computer. The computer with uh, rates this game with a sixty-eight percent win probability, and they predict that Albany State will come away with a twenty-two to fifteen victory over Miles. Twenty-two to fifteen is the score. That's a sixty-eight percent win probability. And so, given all the knowledge that we've uh, shared back and forth, uh, what? How do you see this game going, AB? Uh, one thing that we did not bring up was common opponents, Brian. Before we make those predictions, just to throw that out, these teams had five common opponents. That being Fort Valley, Clark, Lane. More Morehouse and Tuskegee. Both of these teams went five and zero against those uh, common opponents. The one game that you can throw out with those common opponents, Brian, is going to be the Fort Valley game. You cannot use that for a comparison. Uh, Miles played Fort Valley week one. Quarterback for Fort Valley in week one, Brian, was was whom? That that would be Slade Jarman, who was not available in the last game of the season when Albany State played Fort Valley. So we have to throw that game out when we look at common opponents, Brian, and, uh, with these two teams. My, excuse me. Albany State outscored those common opponents uh, by 108 points where Miles was only able to outscore those common opponents by 86 points, Brian. So where where am I going with, with, with all this? It's time to make a decision. Time to make a gut call. When you put these two teams down on paper and compare them to them head to head, it it appears, in my opinion, that these two teams are strength on strength. So whose strength is going to win? I think that Miles has more strengths than Omni State has when you compare strength on strength. Miles does a few a few things good, but Miles does more. Excuse me, Omni State does a few things great. Miles does 
everything good, it seems like. I am going to take Miles in this game, Brian, and I think that it's going to be Miles by a score of 22 to 20. Miles by a score, 22 to 20. I feel like that was a score from another game this year. Or maybe maybe not. Uh, so, my prediction, AD, I'll cut right to the chase on this. Um, I, I did not expect the simulator to be so heavily favored uh, on Albany State. I'm very surprised, again, at some of the, the metrics. Um, Albany State is a team that I really thought very highly of at the beginning of the year. Uh, I still do. I I think there's a little payback in mind, in store, for the Golden Rams. I'm going to go with the Golden Rams. Surprisingly, I'm going to go with a score of... 24-21. So I'm going to go 24-21 Albany State to win. How about that? All right. <laughs> All right. So make sure we got these locked in. Um, any Anything else that we want to discuss regarding the SIC before we jump over to the CIAA? I think the, I think the Albany, excuse me, the Miles win that I am predicting will be enough to get Miles into that number nine slot. That's the one other thing I wanted to uh, bring out, Brian. Okay. Well, um, and and I guess I'll go the opposite because, what, if Albany State were to win defeating Miles, they're in. So – um, uh, let's just say we have a year. I think we both, somehow, some way, we both hope and expect that a SIAC team will be in the playoffs, correct? Correct. That part we can agree on. Perfect. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Let's break. And let's get ready to do this all over again, but this time for the CIAA. Uh, you are listening to the BCSN Sports Wrap, our week number 12 Championship Edition Preview Show. We'll be back right after these words. The Black College Sports Network is proud to partner with ComputerRatings.com. That's C-O-M-P-U-G-H-T-E-R Ratings.com for the upcoming college football season. ComputerRatings.com delivers rankings, game predictions, and statistics for hundreds of professional and collegiate teams. The key feature of ComputerRatings.com is the Versus Sports Simulator, which allows users to simulate any possible matchup and view the predicted scores along with a side-by-side stats analysis. Improve your odds by signing up for a subscription. Monthly, semi-yearly, and yearly subscriptions are available. For our listeners and viewers, use the promo code BCSN19 and get 15% off of your subscription at checkout. Visit www computerratings.com that's c-o-m-p-u-g-h-t-e-r ratings.com Q Time is our classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End. Q Time Soul Food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw. Come on in, relax, and sink your chops into our tantalizing, mouth-watering distinctive soul food with a twist the Q Time way. 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard or call your order in at 404-758-2881. Do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q-Time, an Urban Passport member. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, 
and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC, champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. Hello, welcome to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford here and A.D. Drew uh, coming back out of halftime and getting ready to talk about the CIAA championship game, or excuse me, yeah, the CIAA championship game. Um, we just finished up uh, with the SIAC in the last conference, uh, in the last segment, excuse me. And so let's get right into talking about these two teams, a rematch from last year, uh, Fayetteville State. Broncos and the Bowie State Bulldogs meeting for the second consecutive year. Uh, this is um, also the the third consecutive year that Bowie, uh, Bowie State has been, or excuse me, third consecutive year that Fayetteville State has been in this uh, championship game. Bowie State will be going for their second consecutive title. Uh, last week, in terms of drama, there was none for Bowie State. They had already clinched the North Division. Uh, just put an exclamation point with a big win against, uh, let's see. I, I didn't have it pulled up quickly enough. Last week was against Elizabeth City State, 60-21. to And that came on the heels of a blowout against Lincoln, 65-20. to which was on the heels of a blowout, 52 to 17. The only two teams, the only I'm, I'm just glancing here, the the closest games this year uh, for Bowie has really been the game against Shaw, uh, second game of the season, and that was the game in which they were essentially down 21 to 13, I believe, to Shaw with about five minutes to play, and a pair of blocked punts yielded uh, a touchdown and then a fum or a, a recovery just outside of the goal line that then led to the touchdown or the game winning score. It was really one of the it's really one of the remarkable finishes, collapses, however you want to call it, because let's just think about how that game would have gone had let's just say that second punt block not have happened, or let's just say however you want to spin it, if Shaw had won, this would be a rematch probably of the CIAA championship would be a rematch of that game. Bowie State would have gone on because that game did not count against uh, anything for Shaw. Well, I guess it didn't count against anything for uh, uh, for Shaw either, did it, AD? No, it didn't count either way. It was a non-conference conference game. Okay, so I, I started down a road that I just realized all of a sudden, you know, there was no no pavement on the road, and I, now my tires are are all flat. So, anyway, and let's just you know, Headshaw Headshaw ended up winning. Uh, well, actually, Shaw did beat Winston Salem State in their last game. I guess I should say had Fayetteville State lost to Winston Salem State. And Shaw, who won their last game of the year, we'd be looking at a rematch, Bowie and Shaw. I guess that's what I was really trying to get at, but I muddled it up. Anyway, back to Bowie State and their incredible 10-0 and regular season. I believe it's the first 10-0 and season in Bulldog history. Uh, they have put up, yeah, they, they have put up 50-plus points on, as I run down here, one, two, three, four, five, five straight Five opponents, including the last three. Yes. Yeah, so um, they've got the Offensive Player of the Year in Jerome Johnson, who who really, I, I really have to say, sort of came out of, I don't want to say came out of nowhere, but he really became, he was the unexpected heir apparent to Amir Hall. I mean, I think a lot of people were looking right, and Jerome Johnson was standing over in the, on the left, just waiting his time, and when the opportunity 
presented itself, he took advantage of it, and then he just lit up the league with uh, with his performance. And he will definitely be in the running, I think, A.D., for uh, Black College uh, Football Player of the Year, no doubt. Um, so um, any thoughts about Bowie as you kind of look back on their 10-0 and season? Anything that stands out, surprises you? Anything there? Bowie scored at least 20 points in every game this year, Brian. Something something to keep in mind you know, about their, their proficiency on on offense. And they never gave up more than 21 points the entire season, Brian. Yeah, that's um... – Wow, that's uh, that's pretty pretty doggone in, in, impressive there. Uh, when you do the numbers, and last year's Bowie State team, ad, with Amir Hall leading them, advanced to the second round of the Division Two playoffs. We, I expected a better defensive team. Was unsure what the offense would look like. Given what has happened this year, I would say overall this is a better Bowie State team than last year. So it just kind of – you got to be excited for the probability and the possibility of what's ahead. Let's flip it over to the Fayetteville State side, um, a team that under uh, head coach Richard Hayes, who's in his fourth year, um, they have found uh, a great deal of success uh, because, you know, they have – they again, in Coach Hayes's – Second and third year, they did advance to the championship game. Uh, they lost. Uh, you know what's interesting, AD? Two years ago, they lost to an unbeaten Virginia State team in regular season, right, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Last year, they lose to Bowie State, and now here they are again facing an unbeaten uh, Bowie State. So, uh, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, you're just – you're here, and it's like, okay, what what do we have in front of us, and let's just deal uh, as best as we can. And we look back at the season for Fayetteville State. Um, you know, one of the things that I was probably critical of, and maybe others were, was that they were a, a bene- they benefited from the schedule, the crossover schedule, because they did not have to play the toughest teams out of the Northern Division. They did not play Virginia State, Virginia Union, or Bowie in the regular season. Uh, so, you know, you control what you can control, I guess. But, uh, they, you know, through the course of this year, they definitely benefited. And, but they had a few hiccups along the way. They lost to Wingate in the second game of the year, 34-24. to And remind people, A.D., where is Wingate sitting right now in the Division II playoffs? Number four. So they, they did lose to a, a top uh, 10, top five rated team. Um, then late after getting on a five-game winning streak with wins over Lincoln, PA, Elizabeth City State, Shawan, Shaw, and Johnson C. Smith, I, just think about those five teams I just mentioned now. I mean, those – Except for Shaw, all of those teams losing records, I believe. I I can't recall Johnson C. Smith right off the top of my head. But they lost on October 26th to St. Augustine's 23-21 on a late field goal. And, you know, who knows where Fayetteville State might be in the rankings had they not lost that game and then carried on and got the win over Livingstone, 32-0, and then they closed the season with a win over Winston-Salem State, which I thought was a big win for them. If you think back to last year, A.D., before this championship game, they played Winston-Salem State. Winston-Salem has owned them over the past decade, and they got blown out last year at home to Winston-Salem. And so for them to actually go to Winston-Salem, beat them by two touchdowns, Downs in the second half, that was pretty impressive. And maybe, maybe it's the kind of thing that gives them a, a leg to stand on in this upcoming fight. Uh, your thoughts? Just, just, just a quick thing about the numbers, uh, Brian. Fayetteville only gave up more than 23 points. One time this year, Brian. Excuse me, two times this year. 23 is the magic number. 
Why is 23 the magic number? They gave up 23 points only twice this year. They split those two games. They lost the game against Wingate. Ironically, they won the game 35-34 against Johnson C. Smith. So outside, uh, they've given up single digits twice. You, you, you're good for 20 points against uh, against Fayetteville, against Fayetteville State, Brian. So that, that's a, that's a, one of those magic numbers that you need to watch for, the number 23 for Fayetteville State. They give up more than 23 points to Bowie, chances are they're going to lose this game, Brian. Just looking well, at the numbers. Yeah, well, the the numbers, that, that's interesting because we know Bowie's offense has definitely been putting up points throughout the course of this year. Uh, as we get ready to get into this, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You got something else? Oh, I was going to say, and, uh, Bowie has given up, has not given up more than 21 points. I don't know if I, I know I said how much they've scored on the year, but they've not given up more than 21 points this this entire season, Brian. So just, just a little bit of look preview inside the numbers first team to 25 wins how about that that's 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 probably a, a good call <laughs> the numbers brian right right okay um going into this preview you had the pleasure of talking with head coach damon wilson of Bowie state who is in his 11th year at his alma mater and he has built quite a program there at Bowie state as um they uh, look to repeat as CIAA champions and go further than they did last year. And so you'll get a chance to hear that conversation coming up after this break. And then when we finish with uh, that interview with Coach, we come back and break down the offense and defense from uh, the offense and defensive matchups, Fayetteville State versus Bowie State. We'll be back right after these words, and then you'll hear 80s conversation with Damon Wilson right here on the BCA. Hello, and welcome back to the Sports Rap Show. A.D. Drew here, and joining me on the Versus Simulator Sports Hotline, Bowie State Bulldogs head coach Damon Wilson. Uh, First of all, good morning to you, Coach Wilson. How's everything going up there in Bowie, Maryland? Everything is going great, and uh, good morning to you as well. All right, all right. And let me start off by saying congratulations on a – Tremendous, fantastic season that you guys have been able to put together up there in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, you have ascended to number three in the regional rankings. You are, uh, last time I checked, you guys were number 15 in the national rankings. So uh, just kind of briefly uh, give us a rundown on, you know, the season that you've had thus far and uh you know, what's the feeling that you guys have up there in uh, Bowie, Maryland, Bulldog Nation? It's been, it's, it's been a great season. I mean, these guys that uh, that we were able to bring together and, and, and uh, assemble our team, uh, they really brought into what we have going on here. Uh, it's been a season where, you know, coming off a championship last, last year, graduating 20 guys, uh, I think the outsiders, you know, looked at it as a rebuilding deal. And uh, it's something that we preach around here that tradition doesn't graduate. Someone's name is going to be in the paper for making plays, whether it's a touchdown or making tackles. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to to keep our young men in school and have them matriculate uh, through the university. So, therefore, you know, 20 graduate, we have another class of 24 seniors this year. So, you know, it, it, it's great because the guys are buying into what we're trying to get done. And uh, my coaching staff is doing a great job of paying up for, for, you know, game by game. And talk about tradition, you are in your 10th season, I believe, there at Bowie State. You've uh, you've won some titles. Uh, you've won some Northern Division titles. You, you've gone you've gone on to the playoffs. You know you had that tremendous run last year. Uh, you know sometimes you hate to tell ask coaches to compare teams, uh, but that's my job as a member of the media. Just kind of compare this team with uh, some of the teams that you've coached there over your 10 years at Bowie State. This team may not be the most 
talented team that we we've, we've had here, but these guys just play the game and have a lot of fun playing football. You know, I've never seen a group of young men just just play for one another. You know, and 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 communicate and ha- having fun off the football field. I mean, it's been really some exciting times uh, during the game. We've been down, and I want to say maybe six games that we played thus far this year, whether it was seven points or or ten points. But these guys never. Uh, you know, never panic. Just taking one play at a time and, and, and just continue to play for one another. So it's exciting to see that. It's exciting. We have maybe 10 transfers that we didn't count on coming into the program, guys that went away uh, to other schools and, re- and either received their degrees from the other schools and, and are in grad school here and or finishing up their degree here. And those guys came right in and and, and, and you know, they became, became a part of the family. And those guys are really mentors to the younger guys. So it's just been a great experience just to see a bunch of 18- to 22-year-olds having fun playing a game. You know, you just brought up an interesting point. You know, since the NCAA has created the transfer portal for for athletes, mm-hmm. how, how has that changed recruiting? Because you're able to go out and get guys who you may not have even had on your radar Initially, when you go through the whiteboard, uh, mm-hmm. we, we need this. We, all right, we need an offensive line. And, hey, this lineman just became available from this FCS school or FBS school. So just kind of talk about how this changed the way you you recruit now versus when you first came in. I think that that portal has definitely opened a lot of doors. Um, it hasn't necessarily impacted the way we uh, recruit here at Bowie State. I'm not a big transfer guy. I believe in developing guys from high school on. Uh, but what we do get is a lot of guys that may go away to four-year schools, graduate from that four-year school, and want to come back home to play. Uh, or a guy that went away and decided that school wasn't the best for him and wanted to come back and play. Um, so we're not actively quote unquote recruiting transfers, um, but that the portal has definitely. I know some staffs they live on the track. They have a coach that's uh, designed or there to look into that transfer portal daily to find out who's out there. And for me, I, we don't do that here. Um, most most of the time, when a guy transfers, he's transferred for a reason. A reason is uh, there's always going to be some good, there's going to be some bad. And that I don't think you can build a successful program built around transfers. So for me personally, uh, we do not follow that mo uh, that model here. But we do ex- accept transfers. We do welcome them, and, one, and the ones that come in and buy in, you know, we're able to have some success with them. And that's kind of what we're doing this year with some of the guys that we were able to pick up. Great, great, great. Now your conference is CIAA, uh, one of the four traditional HBCU football conferences, along with the SIAC on the Division II level and the MIAC and the SWAC on the FCS level. Just in, in general, just talk about your, the CIAA in terms of football because, uh, like I've mentioned to a couple of other CIA coaches uh, that I've talked to, the CIA is traditionally a basketball conference. Mm-hmm. But if you sit back and watch, CIA, CIAA plays some tremendous football. We've had some teams out of the CIAA who've made some tremendous runs mm-hmm. in the NCAA playoffs. You guys made a run last year, you know, about 10 years ago, Winston-Salem State made a run to the uh, national championship game. So talk about your conference just on the football level, Coach. I think the conference uh, is becoming more and more competitive. You know, I've been in this conference now eight, 11 years as a head coach, and it's it's a conference where there's really no easy weeks. You know, we, we, we've we been able to win some games this year by, you know, a couple of scores. But uh, going into that week, is not a, an easy week on paper. Uh, this year, I believe we have uh, three teams that can actually – make the NCAA uh, uh, playoffs, if if not four, you know, and, and I think that's a good uh, situation to be in. And I know right now there's uh, us, Virginia, well, Bowie State, Virginia Union, and Virginia State have an opportunity to uh, to continue to play uh, in, in the NCAA playoffs. And at one time that wasn't the case. You know, we may have one team that got in, and uh, right now I think uh, – like I said, we have legit three teams that could possibly get into the playoffs to try to, you know, ca- ca- cause a little confusion, if you will, uh, for the NCAA. Yeah, and uh, those two, two of those teams that you mentioned are on your half of the division, Virginia mm-hmm. State and Virginia Union. Mm-hmm. Union, mm-hmm. and we all we all saw the end of that game of Virginia State <laughs> and Virginia Union on Saturday. I'm not gonna ask you to. Uh, <laughs> To, to comment on that because uh, I, I do know that, that coach of fraternity, you never criticize another right. coach uh, 
the other coach's play call. But yeah. I am I am going to ask you to comment about the just your philosophy as far as going for the tie in that point or going for going for the victory. What kind of gut feeling do you have to go with to make that decision? Hey, I'm 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 gonna just kick the ball and go for the tie or after a touchdown, you know, we're just going to go for the PAT and go for the tie, or when you decide to go for two or when you decide to go for it on fourth down to get to, to get that victory. What go, what goes to your mind in those situations, Coach? I think it's just what you just said is a good feeling, and also with your preparation. Uh, another thing you have to consider, I think, is in, our, our injuries. I know uh, in that particular situation, uh, their kicker was on and off this year with the new, you know, with the injury. I'm not sure what his status is now, but for me, I look at, you know, it's, it's a gut feeling. It's uh, how did this play work at practice? Have we been successfully uh, running? Whether it's a, a fake play, whether it's a two point conversion, you know, we have to go, we have to look at our our, uh, our preparation. And and go with that gut feeling, like you said. I mean, if it's a situation, I've done some things as the head coach where you know I felt good about some things, and we we tried them and it worked. And I've I have made a decision or two where it didn't work. And, you know, it's not a problem until it doesn't work. I think if, we, if, the, if, if that particular situation, if they were able to convert, then it'd been a great call. <laughs> but uh, been as though they didn't convert, you know, there's going to going to draw some questions. Uh, but you know, you got you got to have confidence in your guys, believe in your guys, and go what. Uh, what, what feels right for you at that time as a head coach? That's a you know a tough decision to to make, uh, but you know that's why that's why we head coaches. Yeah, and uh, you know uh, Dr. Parker over there at Virginia Union has done a tremendous job turning that mm-hmm. program around, along with uh, Coach Barlow over at yeah. uh, over at Virginia State. Mm-hmm. Virginia State's probably going to rise to the number six. Uh, ranking in, in the region. Mm-hmm. Virginia Union hopefully will stay in the top ten, which will mm-hmm. give them a chance of uh, getting in if if some teams fall in front of uh, them next week. Let's talk about just your half of y- your conference, <laughs> getting two teams, possibly three teams Mm-hmm. In the playoffs, it just, just it, 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 it's a it's amazing that we that, that 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 could happen. And then you've got a you said a possible fourth team, you know, <laughs> Fayetteville State. State. <laughs> you know, it, it, the, let's be real, Coach. Fayetteville yeah. State would have to upset you in order correct, to ha- in order to sniff the playoffs. But mm-hmm. but it but it is a possibility because any given Saturday. Anything can happen. Just, yeah, just, just, just sit on that, coach. Man, it, it, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's great. Um, I mean, it's, it's not great when we're going through it, which I call the gauntlet. Uh, and that part of the year for us, where we play Shawan, uh, Virginia Union, Virginia State, back to been back to back weeks. It's a, it's a pretty tough run uh, for our guys, uh, but it, it, it's, it's good because if you look at the losses that Virginia Union has, they lost to a ranked school in Virginia State, uh, and they lost to another, uh, lost to us, and they had another loss early to a Lenore Ryan. Uh, Lenore Ryan, uh, who was a ranked school, so they lost all three, three top ten all, teams. All top ten, three ten, ten, ten teams, and Virginia State uh, lost us in a one double A Norfolk school. So you know, I, I think from a, a competition standpoint, I think we're really doing a, a a a great job. You know, building our programs. And you look at Virginia Union and beat a FCS school in Hampton. So <laughs> you know that that has to mean something as well when you're looking at these uh, the rankings and the quality of, uh, of schedule. But it's it's, it's Tough. That, that the Northern Division right now is is very competitive. And when I first got into the conference, the Southern teams were were pretty dominant. When when Shaw, uh, Fedville, Winston Salem, those guys were were pretty dominant when I first got into the conference. Now this flipped a little bit, and we're a little stronger on the Northern side than the Southern side. But uh, like you say, any given any given week. Uh, a team can be beat, but uh, it's good to coach. Uh, this is quality football, and, and watch our young men compete each week. Speaking of those young men, uh, you know, a lot of people had questions coming into the year at the quarterback position for you guys. You know, <laughs> you, you lost a tremendous All-American <laughs> Mm-hmm. Candidate on just about every uh, awards list that he was eligible was uh, Mr. Beer Hall, who's gone on to uh, bigger and better things. Mm-hmm. He had a little bit of a uh, quarter, quarterback carousel at the beginning of the season, but you ultimately settled on Jerome Johnson. And Mr. Johnson has only rushed for 771 yards and uh, thrown for 1,500 yards this year. 21 touchdowns on only six interceptions. Uh, just talk about how they kind of played off with you selling on Jerome Johnson. Just talk about how he has just kind of taken this team over this year. 
Well, well, Jerome transferred into us in January, so he went through spring ball, went through summer workouts. Uh, but coming into the season, Gaston Cooper was starting quarterback. Gaston has been in our program for two years. Uh, he was behind the mirror, and it, it was his time. And uh, unfortunately, coming into the season, uh, that second week of training camp, Gaston suffered a uh, heat-related illness, uh, which caused him to miss a week and a half of practice. And then once he came back from that, he ended up having a high ankle sprain. Uh, so we went into our first game with Gaston as a starter and uh, had very limited practice during camp. But I felt as though he deserved you know, to be the starter. Um, and he ended up playing that first game. We had Jerome play some as well, and then uh, Gaskin had an ankle sprain. And then from that point on, uh, Jerome pretty much took advantage of his opportunities. I think Gaskin has done a great job helping and mentor Jerome through this process. They were great together. As a coach staff, we had decided early that both guys were going to play each game uh, because we think we have two quarterbacks that we can win with, uh, and both cause different uh, problems for uh, opposing teams' defenses. So, you know, both of those guys, were were scheduled to play, um, but the way it 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 it, it took uh, took shape was Jerome just ran away with the starting position and really never looked back. And uh, like I said, Casson has done a great job just supporting him and being a good teammate and being ready to win his numbers call. Now you you've kind of gone from a I guess for lack of a better word, a pass happy offense with mm-hmm. Mr. Hall throwing for over three thousand yards the last couple of years mm-hmm. to back to a little bit of old school football with a, with a lot more running the ball. Mm-hmm. Just go through that transition uh, offensive philosophy, coach. I think uh, I mean, we're running the same running the same plays for the most part. I mean, I have a uh, new offensive coordinator, Tyree Reed, who was my quarterback here uh, for me, but he was a quarterback coach with, uh, for Amir Hall. I think as a coach, you have to adjust to your personnel. I mean, Amir was a special pocket passer, and um, I think I would have been foolish as a coach not to let him sit back there and throw the ball around. And so we, we've we've catered some things to fit. Uh, um, Jerome and Gaskin's uh, skill set, uh, and I think that's part of coaching. You know, a lot of times you you get stuck in, hey, this is my philosophy, this is what I believe in doing, but uh, that's not what the kids do, do best. So you want to make sure that you you show or display what the what the young men can do. Uh, best, and then you build up, uh, upon that. Uh, but Jerome has always, like I say, I think this weekend he was 12 for 17 or so passing. He's a very efficient passer. He has the ability to stretch the field vertically, uh, but he also causes cause some problems with his legs. So it, it, it's, it's, it's been a good situation. Uh, like I said, it is different because you used to send Amir throw for 3,000 or 4,000 yards. Uh, Jerome may not throw for 3,000 yards, but uh, at the end of the day, we're still efficient offensive, uh, offensively in our passing game. And I think we're averaging about 44, 45 points a game. So we're, we're getting some points on the board. So I don't care how, how they get there. <laughs> we just want points. And I think Jerome is doing a good job with that. And in addition to putting up points, you are shutting people down. <laughs> and uh, we talk about the Bulldog offense, but that Bulldog defense has been tenacious, uh, led by people such as Joshua Pryor, uh, 6'4", two, 280 pounds from uh from from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Dimitri Marcel, 5'10", D-back, 170 pounds from Upper Marlboro, uh, Maryland. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, just just kind of hit on some of those defensive uh, defensive stars that you have uh, on your team, there, Coach. That, Joshua Price. This is where it was like this year. We uh, we registered 32 freshmen that we signed this year. And Joshua was a redshirt. I mean, was a freshman for us two years ago, and we redshirted him. Last year was his first year actually playing, and this year, of course, he's his redshirt sophomore year. I mean, he's a he's a force inside. But this is where you're building building a program. I think it's important to have guys like I said earlier matriculate at your university. So now Josh is just in his second year on the football field, but it's third year in the classroom. He's a kid just turned 20 years old, so so he was a, he was a youngster when he got here, but on the football field. So he's he's a grown man, and he's not going to be blocked one on one. So you know he, he's uh, he, he's uh, teams are double teaming him and allowing James Dumas, who's another uh, defensive lineman that we have in here, uh, that's in graduate school that's playing for us from Washington D.C. that uh, is, is able to make some noise. And then when you get to D line putting pressure on the quarterback, it makes it easier for guys like Dimitri to, to you know catch interceptions and play a little coverage. I think Dimitri's right now nine interceptions on a year, if I'm not mistaken, and. Uh, you know he's a force on that back end with Tevin Singleton and Will Flowers. 
So we have some guys defensively that just once again flying around playing football. We lost one of our better defensive players um, halfway through the season to he had a season ending ending injury, uh, but the next guy stepped right up and, and, and made plays. So you know that's that's a philosophy that we we kind of go by here. And the guys buy into it, and it's it's it's, it's great to see. You know, it's, like I said, it's great to see eighteen to twenty two year olds just playing for each other and having fun playing ball. And James Doom is uh, six three, two hundred ninety five pound. One of those grad transfers that you were uh, that you, that you've been talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you guys have pretty much been ranked all season long. Uh, you opened up at number three in the regional rankings. You've stayed at number three. You've been top 20 in the coaches' polls pretty much all year long. Just just kind of in general, talk about the, uh, you know, the polls, the the expectations that come with being ranked, the pressure that comes with with be, with being ranked there, Coach. I mean, I think this is great. I mean, when you're talking about Bowie State football in November and late November, early December, that's great. As a head coach, as an alumnus of the university, that's what I wanted to to bring to the university. That's what I wanted to build upon, and I think the guys have have brought into it. Um, we, we we came in unranked out of the top 25 last year from last year, which I was kind of surprised about, being as though we did go to the second round of the NCAA playoffs, but. The guys, you know, they didn't, they didn't moan and, and 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 cry about it. They just pretty much put the put a, uh, the work together on the football field. And the conference, they they selected us. Uh, said we predicted to uh, go back to the championship this year. And I think once you have that type of uh, expectation put on you, I think it's your responsibility to uphold it. You know, and that's one thing we talk about. Man, if people expect certain things out of us, it's our responsibility to, to do our part. And and that's something that we preach about in the classroom as well as on the football field. You know, I, I believe in challenging these young men, and uh, we don't we don't pressure is not <laughs> is not uh, something we talk about. If you want to. You want to be a special player. You got to go through some special situations. You want to be a special dad. You got to make some decisions in pressure situations. So we want to make sure we're able to handle, you know, those situations. We prepare for them. And I think when you prepare for something, that pressure doesn't bother you at all because it's part of your your regular routine. And I think the guys have done a great job. Our senior leadership. Uh, they've done an amazing job just keeping the young guys on board along with my coaching staff. You know, my defensive coordinator's been with, been here with me for nine years, and I, I coached him. You know, I coached my quarterback coach. There's seven guys on my staff that's played for me here at Bowie State University. So I have a fairly young staff, but uh, these guys really love the university and love what they're doing uh, with, the, um, with our student our athletes. You know, one thing the NCAA did this year was tweak the formula for determining how teams get ranked and mm-hmm. who gets in. Uh, two questions for you, Coach. A, discuss how that affected how you put your schedule together for this year and for future years versus what you've done in the past. And number two, talk about, you know, they, uh, they're going to a uh, – uh, at large after the after the top four so that they can avoid rematches in the f- first round mm-hmm. and uh, some consideration for travel. So just kind of hit on those two things for me, Coach. For, for us, it's, it's pretty interesting because the, with us being in, um, in, in the region that we're in, we may end up not playing a regional opponent the first round of the playoffs, which now we're probably going to play a, a, a team in maybe Region 1 that uh, that we end up recruiting against. You know, uh, Region 1 schools uh, genuinely recruit this Maryland area, so we may end up recruiting, I mean, I'm sorry, playing against someone that we recruit against. So I think for us it's going to work out uh, in our favor. Uh, anytime you're able to go against a, a, your team that uh, that you're recruiting against and you have a reference point uh, to those recruits, if you're able to win that ball game, that helps you in recruiting. Uh, the travel expense, I definitely understand that. Last year we had to uh, travel down by Dawson State, which we flew into an airport and had to drive two hours after the flight. You know, I, under, I understand the cost uh, 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 part of that as well, and most of our schools for us been a, a northern school. Most of the schools in our region are, for, are, are way, way down south, whether it's Alabama, West Florida, uh, Mississippi. So you know we have a, a pretty large uh, uh, region. So it, it, it really is going to help us with recruiting, in my opinion, and it definitely will help with uh, with travel travel expenses from an NCAA standpoint. So once again, if you want to want to be the best, you got to beat the best. You got to go through whoever whoever's on your schedule. You know. We just have to prepare to play ball and, um, and, and go out and execute our game plan. 
Now, that's the first I've uh, heard that in the playoffs, you may wind up playing a team from Region 1 instead of that's from correct. Region 2. That's uh, correct. You know, that, that's, that's, real, that's real interesting. So, uh, it would be interesting to see where that other team from uh, Region 2 would go, uh, especially considering the uh, SIAC right now is on the outside looking in. Uh, right as far as getting into the playoffs. Right. It's, right. it's, going to be, it's definitely be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the playoffs, Coach, uh, what, that's two weeks away at, at minimum. You've got an all-important CIAA championship game matchup against Fayetteville State, the Broncos. This was a rematch of last year's championship game, uh, which you guys uh, – Pretty much won handily last year, but I don't expect that game to be as easy. And if, even if it's easy to us as fans, it's not easy to you uh, as, as a coach. So uh, break down Fayetteville State for us. Uh, break the game down, which, what you're looking for to come in, keys to victory, all that good stuff that uh, you're selling to you guys on this week. Well, Coach Hayes has been there three years, and they've been in the championship game three years. I mean, he's a guy that's coming from a, a – a football family, <laughs> so he, he knows ball. He's able to prepare his guys. Uh, for us defensively, we must stop the run. They have two running backs that can run the football, and uh, they've been pretty successful running the ball against everybody they played against this year. So we must stop the run defensively and offensively. We must run the football to have a chance to win. You know, they're going to they're attacking uh, back in on their defense. They, they're, they're, they're aggressive. Uh, they're going to come with a lot of energy. Um, so we have to match the intensity early and play sound special teams. That's one area this year where we've really uh, – we did, we did pretty well. We've done pretty well, I should say, this year, and taking advantage of uh, our special team plays and uh, really not taking a playoff uh, during our special teams period. So, you know, we got our, hand, our work cut out for us this week. Um, they have a, a new office coordinator who was there a couple of years ago, uh, Coach Flowers, and he, he, you know, he does a good job with uh, with what his schemes offensively. So, like I said, we're sitting here now breaking down film. Uh, we're looking forward to a very competitive game uh, this Saturday, uh, and I was expecting a lot of a large crowd uh, to come out and watch the ball game. It is a rematch, uh, but I anticipate it to be a very physical football game. Do you like the neutral side, or would you like? The, uh the championship game to be a home and home type of thing, you know, whether either best record or mm-hmm. north one year, south one year. Do you like playing at the neutral site, or would you rather be on campus? I'm gonna be honest. I like I like the neutral site. Um, I like getting off campus. I'm a guy that when you're when you're on the road, there's less distractions, so I'm fine with playing <laughs> playing or on or on the road as long as I can bring my crowd with me. And that's one thing that I've been asking alums and and, and the current students. Hey, I need we need y'all here this Saturday. I think it's very important that these that, that the alums and the uh, current students come out and support the guys. Uh, uh, but I definitely like the neutral site. I think it uh, it, it it adds a, a dimension to the ball game as well as takes some distractions off my plate as a head football coach being here on campus. And it's a great advantage for you guys with that game being in Virginia versus down in the uh, Carolina area where Fayetteville State will be traveling <laughs> from. So so your fans can make that three to four hour ride over to. Uh, to the championship site, whereas it may be a six- to seven-hour ride for the Fayetteville Broncos fans. So I do expect a little bit of a black-and-gold crowd there <laughs> in Virginia for the, uh, for the championship game, Coach. Indeed, I hope so. <laughs> All right. Uh, Coach, uh, we're going to get you out of here. Uh, any last words that you want to get in before we wrap this interview up? No, I think this is great what you guys are doing. I think it's great for HBCU football and um, HBCU athletics in general. And uh, we must continue to uh, uplift uh, one another as we go um, on, on and, and competing in, this, in different conferences and just uh, showcasing our young men and women uh, and, and having these young men and women continue to prove that, hey, we can play at a high level and do things the right way and have success. So I appreciate you guys for having me on. All right then, Coach. Uh, we we appreciate you joining us here on the Sports Wrap uh, Show for for Coach Wilson. This is Ad Drew, and we'll see you on the other side. This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. Miac versus Swag, champion versus champion. 
only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. Hello and welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and A.D. Drew here. A.D., uh, great conversation that you had there with Coach Damon Wilson of Bowie State. Uh, anything that maybe you wanted to ask him, didn't get a chance to ask him, or, or just some, some post-interview uh, comments or thoughts that you have before we get into this next segment? The one thing I wish I would have asked him that I did not ask him is how great does this feel for you to be at your alma mater and doing things at your alma mater that have never been done there before, you know, having a perfect season, perfect regular season, which has never been done at Bowie State, you know. It's a great feeling already, but to do it at your alma mater where you graduated from and you played for has really happens to be special, Brian. Yeah, I got to imagine that's a, a real special feeling. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's a matter of, you know, building something greater than possibly what was there when you played, maybe building something better uh, than what you got it as, uh, you know, in terms of when he, when he arrived 11 years ago, um, you know, that's all, all of that. I'm sure is is a is a factor in in uh, you know in, in his mind or something that's in his mind. Uh, I was just taking a look at his career record: uh, 75 and 41, a career 646 mark. Um, you know, career-wise, though, against Fayetteville State, though, he is just three and two against uh, Fayetteville State, and you know, con contrasting that to uh, Coach Richard Hayes, who has never beaten Bowie State at zero and three. So <laughs> there's a uh, you know, which which is interesting. So that would what would that mean is before Coach Richard Hayes, uh, Coach Wilson was zero and two. You know, so everything has its cycle. I, I guess maybe that's the encouraging thing for uh, Fayetteville State fans and Coach Hayes. But um, Damon Wilson, definitely one of the premier coaches in black college football. And, and their season is not done. I, I You know, I feel like this is – their season is really just kind of getting started now. And uh, as they say, what do they like to say, A.D., it's the second season beginning now. Right, and this is when you want to peak. Yeah, definitely, and they appear to be peaking, uh, especially after the last three games, you know, which we talked about. Okay, so here we go into that part of this uh, segment and the show talking about the CIAA, and this is where we break down the teams, uh, the offense and defensive side of the ball. AD is going to start with uh, Bowie State's offense, and I will start with Fayetteville State's defense. So we'll we'll do that. Talk about some key players from each side of the ball. Then we'll flip it. I'll take the offense for Fayetteville. He'll take the defense for Bowie and some key players there. And then any special teams that we may have come up with as well. So all right, AD, let's uh, let's let's get at it. All right, we're going to start off with Bowie State, the most prolific scoring offense in the CIAA. The only team over 40 points per game, Brian, at 44.4 points per game. And when it comes to total offense, Bowie State is number two in the conference at 433.5 yards per game. Uh, only that Chawan Potent offense is ranked ahead of them. Uh, how do they do this? Well, Brian, they really have a pretty balanced attack, averaging 213 yards on the ground, Brian, and averaging 220 yards in in the air, Brian. So a balanced attack, which you really don't know 
which, which way to play this team. If you focus on the run, they're going to pass it on you all day. If you focus on the pass, Jerome Johnson and, and the other people from Bowie State just going to take off and run and run and run all day for you, Brian. So those are the uh, – the, those are the key stats that you need to look at when you are looking at this Bowie State team offensively, Brian. What, what, what you got for defense to stop? Well, the the toughest part for the uh, Fayetteville uh, State defense here is, uh, without a doubt, going to be how they deal with uh, Bowie's pass um, uh, passing offense. And so I'll start there because Fayetteville State. Um, I feel like I'm, I, I want to call him FSU, but I, I worry if I if I shorten it up to FSU, will it confuse people with another FSU? Uh, but for for the purposes of this, we'll, we'll call not the him, way uh, that FSU team. Not the way that FSU team is playing this year, right? <laughs> we say this FSU is doing much better. So yeah, uh, Fayetteville State uh, comes in with a total defense that ranks third. In the conference, uh, 269 yards allowed. And most interestingly, I thought, was that per play, they're only allowing 4.3 yards per play. Now, I mention that because, of course, Bowie's offense is averaging 6.2 yards per play. You know, and they have run, Bowie has, their offense has run almost 700 plays uh, uh, this season, so for them to put up the kind of yardage and the and just the average per play is pretty impressive. So that's one area I think just in general that Fayetteville State has to deal with defensively, and that passing defense of Fayetteville State versus the passing offense is I think where we need to pay attention because you have the number in terms of yards per play. The number one passing offense in yards per play, Bowie State, 8.3, going up against the number one pass defense allowed in yards per play at 5.5. So you've got number one versus number one going right there. And also, um, well, I I wanted to take a look at the defense. I I was going to mention, you know, in terms of uh, interceptions, uh, Fayetteville State really, that's not – the big thing for them in terms of interceptions, uh, they, they rank number six in the conference. Um, their pass defense efficiency, though, ranks second at 99.7. So a lot of teams have not had success passing the ball against them. So that's that's why I kind of circled as one of the key factors in this game is Fayetteville State's pass defense versus Bowie State's passing offense. And I think if FSU can control Jerome Johnson or – it's hard to control this young man because he has thrown for multiple touchdowns. I'm talking, I believe, a couple of games where he's thrown four, maybe five touchdowns. We see the point production. So you you almost have to say – force them to run the ball. And that sounds weird to say, but if Bowie State has success passing, this game will be a blowout, period, point blank. But I think this Fayetteville State team is going to lean heavily on their defensive secondary, and they're going to – and in the trenches and running the ball, I think is the area that Bowie is going to have to have success. So that's the, that's the key thing I'm looking for, and that's the key thing I brought out uh, for uh, Fayetteville State defensively, AD. And uh, how, how about those individuals for Bowie State on the offensive side of the ball? Brian, they're just too, too many to mention, Brian. They're, I, I, I really it, – it, it, it's tough – to single out any any one person with uh, with with Bowie, with Bowie State as far as the uh, stats, but we're gonna we're gonna try our best. We're I think there's one off. guy who's I think there's one guy who's real easy to spotlight on the offensive side of the ball. You mean the, you mean the offensive player of the year at the CIAA Conference, Brian? Yeah, it might be that guy. Might be that guy. That, 
that that would be Mr. Mr. Jerome Johnson, who uh, you know he's averaging seventy seven yards on the ground, Brian, and he's the team's leading rusher. Throw in another one hundred and fifty one yards. In the year, the man accounts for over 225 yards of the 400 yards of offense that this team uh, puts up on a weekly basis. Helping them out with their running game are Khalil Wilkerson, uh, averaging 55 yards uh, per game. Uh, as, as far as receiving the ball, when Jerome Johnson does put the ball in the air, Deshaun, David, averaging 58 yards per game, has 35 catches on the season. Then you have two people tied at 17 catches. That would be Jordan Clark and Deron Smith, Brian. Yeah, um, so for Fayetteville State on the defensive side, everything – I mean, you talk about, you know, the leading uh, tackler um, as, as it relates to their defense. It all starts with Nigel Peel. Uh, he has 68 tackles on the season, which puts him at number six in the conference in that statistical category, 24 solo. Uh, he averages 7.6 per game, which is fourth best in the conference. And, and then a young man by the name of Keyshawn James, uh, another uh, defensive uh, player who is, had 58 tackles this season, 24 of them solo, averages 5.8 yards per. But he's also number two in the conference in sacks with 9.5 sacks. He's also number four in the conference in tackles for loss at 16.0. So, I mean, those are those are the two names I think that most stand out for Fayetteville State on the defensive side of the ball. Um, you know, I, I know that when we when we start talking about the the uh, those two conference players, uh, Keyshawn James uh, made the uh, first team All CIAA defense. Um, I'm just looking here. Uh, he, he was the he was the only first team defensive player, and, and and like I said, that probably had to do with the number of sacks and tackle for loss. You know, I am a little surprised that Nigel Peel didn't make uh, first team, um, and and he did make Nigel Peel did make second team though for uh, Fayetteville State on the defensive side of the ball. So uh, those are the two uh, primary defensive guys that you'll hear. But again. It's a defensive unit that uh, has taken a lot of pride in not giving up uh, a lot of a lot of scores in the air. So it'll be interesting to see what this group as a collective does. All right, Brian. Before we flip sides of the ball, uh, j- just a couple superlatives that I would like to recognize as far as the Booby State offense. First of all, Coach Damon Wilson was the Coach of the Year in the CIAA. Number one, and we failed to mention that. That was the one question that I failed to mention to him during the interview when we recorded it, because this information was out, and I just I just point blank missed it. So, my apologies, Coach Wilson, for not honoring you and recognizing your accomplishment as Coach of the Year. Offensive Player of the Year for Bowie's. Uh, at Bowie State is Jerome Johnson. He's CIAA Offensive Player of the Year. Defense. Uh, uh, also, uh, those are defensive players. We're going to get back to those in just a moment. First team offensive players, all CIAA that play for Bowie State, Deshaun David at, at tight end. Of course, Jerome Johnson at quarterback. Second team uh, players at Bowie State, offensive lineman John Robinson. Christopher Wisman, and if you're an offensive lineman, that should be the only time that you want your name called because if your name gets called too often, that means they're throwing yellow handkerchiefs at you. And 
w- one player that we need to mention when, that we'll mention when we get to special teams, Brian. I'll hold that name close to my vest right now. And also Victor Olawinka Olewink- Olewink- was on the CIAA all-rookie team offensively. All right. Well, let's flip. Uh, let's flip it, and uh, let's go to the Fayetteville State offense. Uh, I guess I'll start there, and then you will you will come in with the Bowie State defense. Um, offensively, uh, they're number four in total offense, three hundred and seventy-two point six yards per game, <clears throat> averaging five point nine yards per play. Now, if you recall, I mentioned earlier that Bowie State has run 699 plays this year. Fayetteville State has run 633 plays. That's almost, you know, some teams only get 60-something plays in a game. That's almost a game's worth of plays that, uh, you know, have been, or or, or, I guess I want to say a game's worth of plays have been run by Bowie State versus Fayetteville. Uh, pretty interesting, I thought, um, you know, and, but of course the yards per play again, remember, <clears throat> sometimes you got to look past the total number uh, and the averages because of those yards per play, and that's why I brought that up, because Bowie is averaging 6.2 yards per play, while Fayetteville is averaging 5.9, so they're not that far off in terms of yards per play, but the production is, uh, or the volume, I guess, is that much greater. Uh, Fayetteville, they're averaging 37.5. I mean, obviously, they are, num- they are number two in the conference, of course. They're sitting, uh, what, a touchdown behind number one ranked Bowie State. So there's another thing, you know, you're being overshadowed a little bit. Uh, total touchdowns, 47 total touchdowns is only six behind. Guess who's in number one? Bowie State. <clears throat> you know, this is, this is a, a, a year that really – uh, Fayetteville State has had a great season. It's just that Bowie State has had a historic season, you know, uh, rushing. Now, of course, we understand first team all uh, all CIAA running back Stevie Green is uh, is the primary ball handler for Fayetteville State. Uh, but as a team, they are rushing for five uh, five yards per play on average, 196.3 yards per game. The five yard per play average is number three in the conference. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in passing the ball, the offense is passing at a rate of 7.3 yards per play. The completion percentage, I thought, was really interesting for the simple fact that it's the number one passing percentage in the league at 62%. So, you know, in terms of efficiency and pass completion wise, uh, I, I thought that spoke volumes for Fayetteville State. Uh, the the passing efficiency is 144.4, which is the second best in the conference. I'll, I'll let you figure out who number one is. It shouldn't be that hard. They're number one in a lot of categories. <laughs> and the last thing I'll bring up, third down conversions. 44.8% is what Fayetteville State is converting at on third down, which is the, the best in the conference at 44.8. So even when backed up on third down, Fayetteville State still finds a way to get the first downs. I think that's in terms of maintaining drives and keeping Bowie State off the field, that's going to be key. I think that I think they're going to have to be on average or better in order to have a chance at winning this game. What are your thoughts there, AD, for uh, as you look at the Bowie State side of things on the defensive side? This team has only given up 16.3 points per game, Brian. They've only given up 23 touchdowns on the season. 23 touchdowns. That's actually number two in the uh, conference as far as touchdowns go. The scoring defense is number one in the conference, uh, Brian. Uh, Total yards. 
they, they're, they're only number four in the conference, Brian, and Tony Yards. You, you you gotta kinda figure that, you know, with them getting up on teams so big, teams just kinda get pass happy, so they're just throwing the ball all over the place against Bowie, but that's why they're a little bit lower than you would expect with them being down at number four. Don't try to rush the ball on this team, though, Brian. They're one of only two teams in the conference giving up less than 100 yards per game on the ground at 94.2. If if you have if you want a chance against Bowie State's defense, you've got to throw the ball. They're the only number eight in the conference, giving up 186 yards per game. Uh, when you're when you're passing the ball against them, but it's not as bad as you think because their defensive efficiency is number one in the conference at ninety six point four percent. So that's that's a missed bag. You, you know you're you're gonna get the uh, you're gonna you, you're gonna get the attempts, but you but don't look to don't look to complete a whole lot of uh, passes. They Teams only completing 48, 47% of their passes against this Bowie State defense. And they've only give, they've given up only 12 yards in the air, excuse me, 12 yards, 12 touchdowns in the air this uh, particular season, Brian. Yeah, I, I think, A.D., the, the, you know, I mentioned one of the two stories or the two matchups that I was interested in was the Bowie State pass offense versus the Fayetteville State pass defense. But then as we talked about the Bowie defense versus the Fayetteville offense, the two things that sort of came out that I'll be looking to see how they play out Obviously, it will be Fayetteville's passing offense versus Bowie's pass defense. I think you have two two upper level, upper tier, uh, well ranked teams or groups, and I think how that matchup plays will go into deciding who wins this game. And then I think the third down factor. You, you know, you just mentioned there um, on third down, Bowie's percentage is number one in terms of opponent's third down conversion rate. Uh, they're allowing, uh, you know, 23.4%, while Fayetteville is number one in the conference at 44.8. So can Bowie get Fayetteville off the field on third down? Can Fayetteville convert on third down? That So those are the, those are the three little factors, I think, in the matchups that I think we have to, possibly come back to when the game is over or as we're watching the game kind of look at and say okay how's this going to break down let's move over to the individual players and I'll start with Fayetteville State and you know last year it seemed like the championship game was sort of a coronation for the career of Amir Hall and Bowie State ended up winning well I, I almost feel like this year should be sort of a coronation for Mr. Stevie Green. Uh, the senior all-CIAA running back has been uh, an outstanding player all four years at Fayetteville State. This is his third championship game that he's having an opportunity to play for. You know, hopefully, I know he's thinking third time's the charm. Uh, this season, he rushed for 1,071 yards, which was the second best in the conference. Uh, he had 14 total touchdowns. And over his four-year career at Fayetteville State, he had 4,406 rushing yards. He averaged 6.0 yards per carry and 107 yards per game. Uh, so that's... Um, that's a that's a pretty uh, a, a pretty outstanding uh, season and career average for Stevie Green, and 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 that's why um, it sort of feels like it could be a coronation if he has a great game, or he's on average or a little bit better than average than his average. He, I think Fayetteville State stands a good shot at winning. The quarterback Richard Latimer. Uh, 
65.9% completion percentage, uh, 15 touchdowns and 9 interceptions, 1,393 yards passing. In terms of average yards per game, he's fourth in the conference, 154.8. His passing efficiency is number two in the conference at 154.8. So uh, Latimer has had a, a good year. You know, hasn't really been talked about too much, but he has been uh, very successful. And then their, their top wide receiver, uh, Tyus Sharp, who has had 41 receptions, 475 yards, five touchdowns. Uh, he averages 11.6 yards per catch, about four yard or four receptions per game, and per game total is 47.5. And so that's sort of the, the top three, the big three, uh, as it stands for Fayetteville State. How about that Bowie State defense? Brian, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of statistics when it comes to this Bowie State defense. I'm just going to let the CIAA superlatives tell you how good this team is on the defensive side of the ball. Let's start off with Defensive Player of the Year, Dimitri Morsell. Who's a, who's a defensive back at Bowie State? Let's let's then move on to the defensive rookie of the year, defensive lineman Jonathan Ross. As we keep moving on down uh, the defense, first team All CIAA defensive lineman Joshua Pryor. Do, do, do you want me to keep going? Oh, why not, Brian? I, I might as well keep going. Second team, all defense, uh, James Dumas. Se, uh, second team, defensive back, Tevin Singleton. And last but not least, CIAA all-rookie team, Raymond, Raymond Boone, Jonathan Ross. All those names I just mentioned, Brian, were on the defensive side of the ball. Oh, my bad. Jo- Jordan Carter, CIAA All-Rookie Team. That's, that, that's like eight names, Brian, that I've just mentioned to you. So don't have enough time. Don't have time to get into all the statistics. We're going to let the CIAA, we're going to let the CIAA superlative to speak for themselves. Yeah, and and you know you troll you're trolling me like I had something to do with all this. Uh, but anyway, I love it. Uh, for for Fayetteville State, I guess I should I should go back and mention their all CIAA selections on the offensive line. You had Greg Brooks and Keon Smith. For Fayetteville State, of course, already had mentioned Stevie Green. Uh, that was the first team group. The second team uh, for Fayetteville State, you had Jalen Galloway on the offensive line. So that's three offensive linemen either making first or second team. Uh, and um, I guess as there's sort of a good transition into the special teams talk that we'll have as Fayetteville State had – uh, special teams kick returner Johnny Giaspi, um, Glaspie, excuse me, Johnny Glaspie. Uh, he was actually a second team kick returner for Fayetteville State, and he's actually the number one kickoff returner per average in the conference, 27.8 average. Now, he only returned 16 kickoff returns this season, but 444 yards is still pretty impressive for just 16. You know, it's not, you know, when you look at it like that and you're saying, okay, you know, Fayetteville State has only given up, I think the number is like 18 points a game. You're not giving up too many touchdowns on a regular basis, so it doesn't give, it doesn't give room for a lot of kickoff returns. Now, the kicking game, though, uh, you have Elton Andrew, who, as a field goal kicker, was second best in the conference average with an 85.7% make average, uh, six of seven. Not a lot of field goals, but when he took them, he was efficient. And then punting the ball, how about Jacob Young, who he had 37 punts this year, 39.3 average. Uh, 15 inside the 20, four of them were 50-plus yards. The 15 inside the 20 was the second best in the conference. So, 
you know, in those situations when Fayetteville State is not completing third downs, they have a pretty capable punter that can extend the field a little bit for them. Any special teams recognition or any thoughts on the special teams unit for Bowie State? Once again, Brian, I'm going to let the CIAA suppose to speak for this Bowie State team. First team uh, punter, uh, Kenny um, Amaya. Second team, CIAA place kicker, Gene Carson. Gene Carson, he was 8 of 11 on the season, uh, just under 73%. Uh, pretty accurate from under 40. He was six. He was uh, 7 of 9, uh, less than 40 yards. He was 1 for 1, 40 to 49, and 0 for 1, 0 for 1 over 50 yards with the long of 40 yards for the season. But probably more imp- importantly than the, the second team, Place kicker is the first team punter, Kenny Amaya, punted the ball only 30, only 32 times, which is extremely low for his punt. But he has an average, Brian, of 41.6 yards per punt, Brian. 41.6 yards per punt. Uh, 13 of those were inside the 20, Brian. He boomed 50 of them for, excuse me, five of them for over 50 yards. And get he gets a lot of, gets a lot of hang time. So almost one out of four of his punts are fair caught. Uh, he has seven, seven of them were fair catches uh, this year, Brian. So that me, that means he's getting the ball and punting the ball where they, even if they catch it, they're not able to do anything. And that that may help this movie state defense out because he he'll, he'll be pinning Fayetteville deep in its own territory. All right, well said. So that's going to wrap up the uh, individual units, uh, the offense and defense for both teams and special teams. When we come back out of this break, we give you some predictions, and uh, then we uh, and then a little more. So just uh, hang in there with us. We'll be back right after these words. You are listening to the BCSN Sports Wrap. We'll be back right after this message. This December 21st, the best in HBCU football will collide in Atlanta at the Celebration Bowl. MEAC versus SWAC. Champion versus champion. Only one team will rise above the rest and claim the coveted Celebration Bowl trophy. Come join the celebration at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this December. For more information, visit thecelebrationbowl.com. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford and A.D. Drew. Find us on Twitter. You can find A.D. at BCSN Drew, D-R-E-W. And you can find me at DRB365. All right. um, Here we go, A.D. It's the moment of truth now. As we... We look at the Versus Sports Simulator to try to gain an understanding of what the computer models think will this game will result in. But before we do that, obviously, you talked about it earlier. We've talked about it in the article for the Division II playoffs, what's at stake. We firmly believe that a win or a loss, Bowie State is in. If they win, they're hosting they very well could end up as the one or two seed if a couple of other teams in front of them lose. Is that correct? And if they if they lose, if they happen to lose, they're still in the playoffs, just probably would not be hosting. Do we have that correct? That that is correct, Brian. Uh Okay. That Valdosta State or Lenore Ryan, if one of them lose, then Bowie Bowie may wind up in the number two or possibly the number one slot if both of them uh if both of them lose. So it's very 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 imperative for them to win to set themselves up. Right. And the number one seed does get a bye. So for Fayetteville State, they just entered into the top ten of the regional rankings. So as it's been stated, if they were to win the conference and fall into the number nine spot, they would eventually they would knock out 
somebody who is in the top seven, probably somebody in the lower half of the seven, who did not win their conference. Uh, is that correct? I have that right. That is correct. They would knock out the lowest, the, the number nine team would knock out the lowest seed, uh, the which, right seed. Now is, which right now is Virginia State. Uh, if, if some chance, by some chance, Albany State and Fayetteville State finish eight and nine, then the six seed would be gone also. Okay, so the, that is the scenario that would have to take place in order to get three HBCU teams into the region, into the playoffs. It's still a possibility that it could happen. You know, are we rooting for it? Well, you know, I'm sure the people in Miles, the fans of Miles, they're not rooting for it. Uh, although they're rooting for a whole different kind of scenario. They're, they're hoping that Fayetteville State wins and a couple other people um, <laughs> lose. So, but as it right. just relates to and the people in Virginia are hoping that uh, none of the above happen and that, yeah. and that they do not fall. <laughs> right, right. So just as it relates to Fayetteville State for the terms of this conversation, they are the 10 seed. They're coming in with uh, high hopes, but they know that if you don't take care of business and win this game, all the other stuff is irrelevant. With that Correct. said... Let's go to the versus sports simulator. I thought what was interesting here, I just always like to go take a look at two things on here. I go to look at the best wins, best losses, or, or sorry, best wins and worst losses, that kind of thing. And I also like to look at opponent record. Uh, neither team had an opponent's record or their opponent's records be as good as Albany State, in my opinion. Um, Albany State is the only team, uh, HBCU team, that's in the playoff hunt with the RPI over 500. So Albany State had the strongest uh, record. The only team that had HBCU that had a RPI better than Albany State were the Shaw Bears, who just missed the opportunity to play for the CIAA championship. Correct. So, you know, um Bowie State has uh, their opponents, uh, and you know they are they are nationally ranked. Uh, they're they're number one in our polls, but their opponents have a 37 and 61 record, while Fayetteville's opponents have a 35 and 64 record. Um, that's you know that is what it is. You know um, the best win. For each team, best win for Bowie State would be against Virginia State. The best win for Fayetteville State would, would be against Shaw. Um, so just to just to sort of set you up, uh, you hinted at who would win this game. So if you read AD's column, you know who the simulator wrote or who the simulator picked to win. I will give it for everybody else. Uh, by a margin of 12 points, the simulator sees or predicts a repeat champion in the CIAA as they have a final score of Bowie State 39, Fayetteville State 27. So that's what the computer models say. A win probability is 76%. AD, uh, I'll start with you and ask you, how do you see this game or what final score are you willing to put behind your name with this game? These teams had seven common opponents. Bowie beat, obviously Bowie beat all of those seven common opponents that they play. Fayetteville was six and one against those common opponents, losing only to St. Augustine as the one common opponent that they lost to that both of them uh, play. Brian, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I I think this game is going to be close through three, through three quarters, and then Bowie is going to pull away in the fourth quarter, and they're going to pull away. And Rocky, it, it, it's going to be their defense, Brian. Their defense is going to pull away with either a pick six or a uh, – or a turnover by by Fayetteville that's going to set up 
a score or two in the in the fourth quarter. And I see Bowie State winning this game by three scores, Brian. Wow. Okay, you're going big time twenty one plus point margin. Last year it was thirty to ten. I think you get a closer, better game this year. Uh, look, I'm not betting against history. Uh, I, I think Bo- this Bowie State team has proven to me that they are better than last year. And I, I think Fayetteville State is better than last year. I So that that is sort of the, the crux of this. You're, you know, for Fayetteville State, though, you're just you're playing against history. You need this is one of those moments when you talk about playing a close, perfect game. That's what needs to happen. The statistical advantages that we talked about, they need to all play in Fayetteville State's favor, and then they need to win the turnover battle. They need to win the third down conversion battle, uh, first downs, time of they need to win all that stuff in order to to beat. Uh, Bowie, and if it's a late ball game, under five minutes to go, you're up maybe ten points. Please, 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 Fayetteville State, don't punt the ball. Just run it. Don't end up like you know another team that had Bowie State on the ropes and ended up losing uh, because of the special teams units. Uh, so I'm going. I'm not going against history. But I'm going a close game, though. Uh, I'll go Bowie State 28, Fayetteville State 24. All right. All right. So um, let's see. Anything else? No, and I think that'll that'll close the CIAA discussion. When we we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna wrap up the show talking about our brand-new top five poll, an interesting development, I think, in the D1 poll. And then we will talk about the other main games. You know, the MEAC and SWAC are sort of on the back burner this week, but they've got some real interesting games to, uh, to, to, that will take place and that will decide what's going on. But um, this is a big weekend for the Division II teams, and I think it should be celebrated as such. And so I hope you stuck in there and enjoyed this segment with us. We're going to take a break, come right back with more on the BCSN Sports Wrap with Brian and AD. waiting for you at more than 325 hotels around the world. Book today at Doubletree.com. Doubletree by Hilton, where the little things mean everything. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. It's like a loop machine. Going around town, trying to get down. Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian Fulford, AD Drew here with you. And uh, we're going to get close to wrapping this show up, but uh, we want to take care of some of the other things going on. I know we spent a heavy amount of time talking about the big matchups in the SIAC and the CIAA. Let me just remind people the game times and the locations where you can watch these games. So 
1 o'clock Eastern time. That's what time the CIAA championship starts. Uh, it is a 1 p.m. kickoff in Salem, Brian. Virginia. Brian, not, not to be cutting you off, that game got moved to 3 o'clock because it, it's on its fire now. Okay. Well, I I appreciate that. So, again, let me reset that. The CIAA championship game between Bowie State and Fayetteville State takes place on a neutral site in Salem, Virginia. That's a 3 p.m. kickoff. It is actually the second championship game of the day. It takes place one hour after the SIAC championship game, which will appear on ESPN3. Uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and that game is being played at Albany State's Coliseum or Stadium. Uh, Miles traveling there, Albany uh, host, uh, which, you know, so we've got one neutral site game for the CIAA, and then we sort of have a a home game for uh, Albany State. Uh, so 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. kickoff. So what, what do you prefer, A.D., the neutral site or or the uh, some or the division winner from one side or the other hosting the championship game. Honestly, I prefer on campus, some 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 way somehow because the atmosphere and engaging the students on on a campus is much more intriguing than neutral site games especially in a Salem, Virginia, where there is no natural fan base for either one of these two teams. But do you think in that particular But do you think that Bowie State has had a perfect season 10 and 0. Um mm-hmm. let's just say if Miles, you know, had been I mean, well there are one there one game difference between Miles and Albany State, but let's just say Miles never loses to Central State, and they had finished a regular season 9-1 and one with no losses to Division II opponents, they, you know, 9-0, and oh, and then they had to travel for the championship game in a hostile environment. I don't like to use the word fair, but for lack of a better word, is that fair to the division winner with the best record? So, in other words, you like the uh, the swag bottle where the team with the best record gets the host. Uh, I I do actually. I, I think if you play and you win with the most conference, you know, if you look amongst the two sides and whoever has the uh, whoever has the best record among the two, and I'm not talking going all polls either because that too can be a little biased and tricky. I'm just talking about hey, you're the best based on our rules of conference and let that team host the championship game. I like that model more than the SIAC model, if I'm being honest. All right. I, I, I'm, I'm more I, – I, I guess I'm more in – probably in favor of the SIAC model, you know, you you know coming into the season, if you win your half and it's and it's that odd year, that even year, depending on which side of the uh of the division you're on, you're gonna host the game. So it's just a matter of take, taking care of business. All right, well said. Um there's one other game happening in in Division Two that is definitely worth talking about, and it affects West Virginia State, who, if I'm not mistaken, AD, they are number what six or eight? Is six, it six or eight? Six, six in Super Region One. Okay, they're six in Super Region One. They are taking on number one in their conference as well as one of the top teams in their no, region. No, number three. Number three, yep. Yeah. Uh, Notre Dame uh, of Ohio. And that is a home game for West Virginia. And Notre Dame, I mean, this Notre Dame team might run through the other Notre Dame team up in South Bend. That's how dominant this team has been. Uh, what's your thoughts on – what West Virginia is up against this upcoming weekend. 
They're up against a tall, tall battle. Notre Dame really has not been tested at all this year. They've dominated that conference. They are undefeated in that conference and in Division Two ball. Uh, West Virginia has a tough task ahead of them. West Virginia State has a tough task ahead of them. But it, it's pretty simple. Win and they're in. Lose and they're done. West Virginia State has not beaten any of the top teams in their conference, which is why they're sitting at the number three spot in their conference, although they're the second, they're, they're ranked number two as far as teams out of their conference in the regional rankings. Go exp, go try to explain that to somebody, Brian. But anyway, you know, real simple. When you're in, if you're, if you're West Virginia, in West Virginia State, if you've taken, if you would have taken care of business in any of the previous three weeks, you would also be in. So, if West Virginia State does not get in, it's nobody's fault but their own because they controlled their own destiny for the last four weeks, Brian. Well, one of the key players that West Virginia is going to have to try to find a way to slow down is going to be uh, a sophomore running, just a sophomore, it's ridiculous, sophomore running back, Jaleel McLaughlin. Uh, this young man has put up, uh, I mean, look, he, he's, he's, he's rushed for 1,845 yards in 10 games played. Uh, if you combine the few receiving and kickoff return yards that he's put up, he has rushed for all purpose 1,907 yards and 260 plays. I mean, you talk about getting a healthy dose of Jaleel McLaughlin. Uh, he averages 190.7 yards per game. I mean, that is that is some serious numbers. And, I mean, that's essentially who you're trying to stop. You're trying to stop McLaughlin and that running game. And, and after what West Virginia did this past weekend, that's why I say it is a tall order for them this week. But, you know, they've got a good group of talented offensive players, and they have definitely been one of the uh, shining stories this season. Any any final thoughts on how do you, how do you see this one going, A.D.? Do you give – do you give West Virginia State a chance at winning this ball game? I give them a chance. I won't give them two chances, though. I I, I, I want West Virginia State to win because I want my HBCUs to win. But if I, if I was in Vegas, it's Notre Dame of Ohio. All right. Well said. Well said. So – uh, let's let's uh, let's do this, AD. Let's kind of go over our top five poll for week number twelve. Going into week number twelve, um, we didn't we didn't put this out earlier. We purposely uh, just because really I thought we didn't have too much of a change or a shift, and we wanted to kind of keep the attention really on this CIAA and SIAC championship game. So, but I'll start since we just finished talking about the quote-unquote under D1 level. that We'll start with that top five under D1. And, you know, surprisingly, and I think it's surprising to me, but nobody lost, uh, our top five didn't change from a week ago. Bowie State still sits at number one. Miles College is still number two. Savannah State, whose season is over, finished not seven and three, finished at uh, number three. Langston, their season's not quite over. They're still playing. They're at number four. And number five, Virginia State, whose season is over at eight and two. I guess Virginia, I was – go ahead. Well, Virginia State's season's not officially over. Their se- I meant their, their regular their... season is over. I'm sorry. I okay, meant their sorry. regular season is over at eight and two. Thank you for, for the clarification on that. And- and uh, speaking of one other team in that poll, Brian, Langston, uh, the Langston Lions have a tall task. They currently sit at number 21. They've got to get up to 16. They need some serious help. They need some teams in front of them to lose. And I'm not sure how the CIAA does it, but Langston is still playing for conference supremacy conference uh, for the conference championship. So, uh, you know, 
let's, let's see if Langston can go and at, at least win the conference and keep that streak going. Right, the they're in the midst of uh, they're going. in the midst of a three way tie. Three way tie, correct. And so I, I no clue as to how those tiebreakers are working over there in uh, Oklahoma in their soon athletic conference. Okay, so we didn't. I know we talked about this earlier in the week. We never got a clarification on their tiebreaker rules. No. Okay, so we'll have to wait and see how things shake out. But they were definitely they took they were definitely received a favor from. Uh, Lion, uh, Lion College, I think Lion College it was, who beat yes. Ottawa. And, you know, it was funny, Langston beat Lion by a score of 60 to 7, 60 to something, 60 to 9. And so a close ball game, Ottawa loses, and it pretty much now has a three-way tie. And I'm sure – I'd be willing to bet, bet whoever is the top seeded team is the team that goes because you really have a triumvirate of you beat A beat B B beat C and then C beat A. So Wait, it, and, and using using that scenario, Langston is number two right now. Ottawa is one one spot ahead of Langston. Right. So in the polls. Yeah, we, we've got to find out kind of what the tiebreaker rules are, you know, so on and so forth, and, and figure all that out. Uh, okay, let's move over to the Division One poll. This is pretty interesting, A.D., um, and I'm going to – so brace yourself because I'm going to ask you how you voted, um, I, you know, if you don't mind, because I think there's an interesting discussion to be had here regarding our top five, and, and definitely I'm sure people will have some comments or, ha or feel some kind of way about it. But I'm going to start at the bottom, okay? I think that might be the best thing to do. Number five, coming in at number five in our poll, South Carolina State Bulldogs. South Carolina State with a record of five and three, manhandled Howard 62 to 21 last week. And they're sitting pretty with two losses, and they really don't have a quote-unquote uh, tough, con uh, tough contest in the final two weeks of the season. Although I will say, you know, they play North Carolina Central, they play Norfolk State, the two teams that, you know, remember we had this conversation about three, four weeks ago about who might who might trip somebody up? I mean, of course, we totally looked past Delaware State and Morgan. But I think we both agreed it was North Carolina Central and A&T, or I think one of us had Central, one of us had A&T. You recall that conversation? Yes, I do. Yeah, so that's what South Carolina State is dealing with because A&T has not only Bethune this week, and Bethune has A&T, but both of them did have their big rival games the last week of the season, A&T versus Central and Bethune versus Florida A&M. I would tend to say South Carolina State has the easiest, easiest road to remaining unbeaten among North Carolina A&T and Bethune, my personal, my personal thought. Leading up to number four. Number four this week, the team who dropped a game uh, up in Morgan, Baltimore. It would <clears throat> excuse me. It would. It would, would that it be, would North, be, that'd be North Carolina A and T? Thank you for bailing me out on that. Thank you. Yes, it would be North Carolina A&T Aggies. As I, you know, I, I was wondering if you would jump in in there, but yeah, <laughs> North Carolina A&T Aggies. I'm so choked up the fact that they are number four. Uh, yeah, that, that's what it was really. But yeah, the Aggies are number four after that loss, um, six and three overall, uh, twenty-two to thirteen loss. You know, they are still in the hunt for the Celebration Bowl and the the conference-recognized MEAC championship. I, I want to come up with the right saying for this. If Florida A&M holds on and goes unbeaten, how do we describe 
the team that goes to the Celebration Bowl? How are we going to describe them? Maybe we start it now and see if it carries. Uh, they are just the representative. The BX okay. representative. That's, that's the best way to put it. Okay, so we, we will call whoever comes out of the MEAC that that wins the quote-unquote championship in the eyes of the conference, we are simply calling them the MEAC representative because if Florida A&M remains unbeaten, they, would be, they should be the true champion. But anyway, A&T, the Aggies, have the big game this week against Bethune-Cookman. Uh, that game is being held in Greensboro, so that's the one big advantage the Aggies have. And then they have uh, the following week they play uh, North Carolina Central in the Aggie Eagle Classic. Number three, the Alcorn State Braves. Lost in overtime to Grambling, 19-16. Uh, to 16. They're 6-3 and three now. Uh, they, they have sort of, Alcorn has sort of opened the door inadvertently probably uh, to to a lot of different just scenarios. I mean, you know, it's not, uh, it's no guarantees from this point forward for them. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, uh, Alcorn really has to uh, take a look at <laughs> take a look at uh, what's in front of them. I was trying to see if I could pull up their schedule here real quick. I know they have Jackson State coming up. Oh, uh, who else? Uh, any ideas real quick, AD? I'm, I'm pulling it up here while I'm talking. Alcorn State. Uh, um, any, any, any so far, uh, the first – Five, four, and three here. While I'm looking that up, any any thoughts there, AD? No, uh, Brian. I'm just kind of uh, not, it's not how I voted. <laughs> that's all I can say. Okay, that that's why I said, like I said, I I want to hear how you voted here, and uh, it'll be very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So this, you know, Alcorn State has to play Alabama A and M, which. That makes for an interesting matchup because between Alabama A&M and now Jackson State, that's the last two opponents for Alcorn. That's not an easy game. I mean, they they really kind of, you know, after beating Southern and then losing to Grambling here by a field goal, they really opened the door and gave A&M and Jackson State a little bit of hope, although uh, A&M beat Jackson. So I, I think – I. Th- in all, what I want to say, I guess, is in a nice little bundle, an A&M victory over Alcorn State really makes a mess of the SWAC, uh, SWAC East. Are they the East? Yes, they're the SWAC East. Yeah. Makes it makes a big uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, number two. Moving all the way from number five up to number two. The Grambling State Tigers, winners of five games in a row, currently with a record of five and four. And, you know, the Tigers, I'd be willing to say, D, this this may be shocking to people, but think about who lost in front of them, okay? From our previous poll, the two, three, and four lost from our poll. Now, South Carolina State, I don't think, was in the poll. And Southern played Virginia Union Lynchburg. Not really a competition where it's almost like that was a that was a, a JV scrimmage game. You know, with all respect to Virginia Lynchburg, I mean, there's no you're not staying close to Southern there, and I, I hate to say that. But Grambling, and, and here's the argument: anyone who looks at this poll and say <clears throat> Grambling is five and four, how could you guys put them at number two? Well, let's take a look at the four losses by Grambling, okay? I think that needs to be looked at in its proper perspective. First off, they lost to Prairie View in a shootout, 42-36. to So they lost by six points, 
uh, in a game where a ton of points were put up. They lost on a neutral site. Um, that should not be lost on anybody. And I think that was the game Dewanya Tucker rushed for like 260-something yards and a couple and more than one, one or two scores, okay? But Grambling was still in that ball game. 42-36 to 36 was the final. The week before that, Grambling lost by three points to Albany State, 23-20. to 20. The week before that, uh, or two weeks before that, Grambling lost to FC, uh, FBS La Tech, Louisiana Tech, by a score of 20 to 14. Okay? Uh, and that was the game, if I'm not mistaken, I'm just going to quickly pull up the um, board. Yeah, Grambling actually played a better second half as they outscored uh, La Tech 14 0 in the third and fourth quarter. I mean, they were down 20-0 at halftime, but, you know, they had pretty much brought themselves back in the second half, and they shut out La Tech in the second half. The only game of Grambling's four losses that was by more than a touchdown was the opening game of the season to Louisiana Monroe, 31-9. So I would challenge you to think that in the midst of pl they're playing a five-game winning streak, and before the five-game winning streak, they lost three close games by anywhere from or six points or less. Is there anybody in black college football in the past month, A.D., playing better than Grambling? I sit back and listen to your argument. With Jackson State having lost this uh this past weekend, the only team that's playing as good, if not better than Grambling, is our number one team, Brian, in our polls. Okay. So, you, but I'm curious, did you vote for Grambling at number two? No. I'm I curious. had Grambling in, but Grambling was down towards the bottom of my poll. Oh, so did you move them up from five? They they were at the bottom of my poll, so they I, I stayed at I five. Grambling, I moved I moved Grambling to four. Okay, so who was your? T I'm just curious. I mean, you, who was your who was your number two? My, my number two actually was SC State, South Carolina State. Yes. Okay, so you basically moved, and they were out of the poll, and you moved them all the way up to number two. Yeah, but South Carolina State also had received – I had voted for South Carolina State the week before that, and they were my number five the prior week. Okay. What about Southern? Uh, th there's a – you know, I don't know. You know, Southern, their record is six and four. Should Southern have been in the discussion? Should they have been in the top five? Should they have made it to the top? Five. Southern has not been consistent this year, so they got to Southern has got to pull off another victory, an impressive victory, in order to move into the top five. You know, without how, how can we say without them having without them moving in by default, and what I mean by default, everybody in front of them losing. Yeah, I, you know, number one is Florida A&M in our poll again, you know, for probably fourth or fifth consecutive week. The Rattlers were on a bye this past week. This week they play Howard. Uh, yeah, so I, I just, I, you know, I just think that Grambling's a great case study about polls and people's opinions on polls, you know, because – I think Alcorn's a good team. I think Graham. I, I think I think North Carolina A&T is a good team. I still think Bethune and South Carolina State are good teams. But when you measure them up and say who's won and who's lost, I mean, like I think Alabama A&M is right on the verge. I still think had they not lost a week before to Southern, they would be they would be sitting possibly at the number two or three spot in my opinion, had they not lost to Southern and then still had the game they had against uh, Jack, uh, Jackson State. 
you know, I think Alabama A and M is right there. They just can't seem to consistently win two games in a row, which, you know, this week is it for them. Uh, so Grambling, um, as I said, they they are number two in our polls. So to recap, Florida A and M at one, Grambling at two, Alcorn at three. North Carolina A&T 4, South Carolina State number 5. And uh, speaking of Alcorn State, um, we mentioned that uh, Alcorn, uh, they lead, they're leading the East. They're 4-1. and one. They have uh, one game over Alabama State, Jackson State, and Albany, uh, Alabama A&M, all, who all have two losses. You know, the, the advantage for Alabama A&M is they beat – Alabama State, and they beat Jackson State. So a fourth win in conference would instantly move Alabama A&M over those other teams. And it just so happens that this week, uh, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern time, at Alcorn State, uh, yeah, in Lorman, Mississippi, Alabama A&M will have an opportunity to move into first place. That's how big this game is for them. They actually have an opportunity with a win to move into first place over Alcorn. Uh, so, you know, you talk about controlling your own destiny, which we've heard that phrase used on more than one occasion. It's all in the hands of Alabama A&M. You know, win this game on the road, and you are that much closer to playing in the SWAC championship game. And I think that would be amazing for them. And it, again, for a team that has not been consistent in winning two strong games in a row, here it is. If you don't do it now, you're not going to do it because we're at the end of the season. On the other side of the SWAC, it's uh, Grambling at 3-2, and two, sitting a game behind Southern at 4-1, and one, which essentially now makes the Bayou Classic on November 30th for all the marbles, I mean, Grambling is playing a 1-9 Mississippi Valley State this Saturday. <clears throat> uh, after seeing what happened last week, A.D., I don't think we'll say, I won't use the word guarantee victory, but uh, let's just say Grambling will be favored. Highly favored. Highly favored, exactly. So uh, it, any thoughts or predictions on uh, how the SWAC, games will go or any thoughts on how you see it playing out? Go Bulldogs. That would be the A and M Bulldogs. I think A and M is probably probably going to beat Alcorn. You think Alcorn wins that uh, you think Alabama A and M beats Alcorn this week. Is that what you're going with? Yes, is that your final answer? Yes I yes I am. Yes it is. <laughs> Okay, wow, that's a, that's a, you heard it there. A.D. Drew calling for the big upset, Alabama A&M over Alcorn State. <clears throat> Let's jump over to the MEAC where the MEAC representative in the Celebration Bowl is still at stake. The big game that we thought we would be spotlighting has been overshadowed a little bit. The fact that Bethune and North Carolina A&T lost this past Saturday um, in Week 11 really sets up this matchup as I, I can't call it an elimination game, but it puts the pitcher into a clearer frame. And I, what I mean by, I'm not going to quite say A&T controls their destiny, but they have, they move into a front runner spot on the pole with a win over Bethune Cookman because they would then be, the team with two losses that sits ahead of anyone else. Because right now, they've beaten South Carolina State, who has two losses. And I think that is, yeah, that's it. So, a t actually, you know, in the final, final game of the season is North Carolina Central. Uh, and, and crazy as it sounds, A.D., uh, North Carolina Central has three losses. I ooh, I could take us down a rabbit hole, A.D., 
and I think I could find a way that Norfolk State could be the representative. I don't, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna save that for maybe a private conversation between you and I. But I just see yes. it. I, <laughs> I I'm not gonna put it out here on wax. But I there is a scenario. I think I see it that Norfolk State could, with three losses in the conference, find themselves as the MIAC representative. Now, but let's let's digress. Let's bring it back to what everyone's paying attention to, this A and T versus Bethune Cookman matchup. Bethune Cookman now with the win, they become sort of the well, they don't necessarily become the front runner because of the loss to South Carolina State. Should South Carolina State end up winning their game this week uh, against North Carolina Central, um, a Central win along with the Bethune win means that both of those two teams would have two losses. <clears throat> North Carolina a t would be very close to eliminated. They'd be very close to being eliminated. And... South Carolina State would be the team in the top pole spot going into the final week of the season. Bethune still has to play Florida A&M following this week. And then that brings us to South Carolina State, who plays North Carolina Central this week, who has three losses. Uh, I mean, North Carolina Central has three losses. South Carolina State has two. And then Norfolk State the following week. And the uh, Norfolk State Spartans are playing Delaware State. So, you know, Delaware State, they may be just celebrating, maybe celebrated too much. Uh, the fact that they got their first conference win and they're not winless. Norfolk State has played pretty well, uh, really well. Jawan Carter has uh, had a great last couple of weeks uh, passing the ball. And I think that will open up the door. So, again, I'm not going to say it, A.D., but I can. I have a scenario that Norfolk State still has a shot. Uh, any thoughts about the MEAC race and these upcoming games? No, the conference that we thought was the stronger conference of the, t of, of the two between the MEAC and SWAC, with everybody whooping up on each other except for Florida A and M has turned out to be uh parity. I guess parity is the word for both of these conferences this year, Brian. Ooh. You made you made it sound like such a such a dirty word, A D. Parity. <laughs> dirty word. Go get okay. Your <laughs> oh wow. Um, out. <laughs> Let's uh, – a couple other games just on the docket. Um, we've got uh, Langston. Uh, we already mentioned them. They've got Wayland Baptist this weekend. Uh, we, uh, we've got Hampton against Kennesaw State. That's in Hampton, Virginia. That's an interesting matchup just from the standpoint of Kennesaw, Kennesaw State, one of the top teams in the, uh, in the country. Um, that, going down the schedule, Jackson State versus Southern. The Soul Bowl, as they call it, the uh, Sonic Boom of the South versus the Human Jukebox. Uh, definitely, folks will be sticking around for the fifth quarter. Uh, I'm looking for plus 32,000 people at, uh, at Jackson State's uh, stadium this upcoming weekend. So you'll probably have some great weather. Uh, that is a 3 p.m. Eastern kickoff. Uh, our friends at Edward Waters College, they're going to wrap up their season traveling to Prairie View, uh, taking on the Prairie View Panthers in uh, Houston, Texas, or in Prairie View, Texas. Uh, so uh, shout out to uh, Joshua Jackson and the uh, coach uh, Greg Ruffin as they uh, wrap up uh, a season. That's been, it's been a difficult season for the Tigers, but it definitely has been eye-opening playing a heavy SIEC schedule, proving to many that they can compete. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Uh, Tennessee State hosting UT or on the road to UT Martin. We're coming up on the final days of Chris Rowland uh, or, or Rowland at the uh, of Tennessee State, and we're we're going to kind of uh, see how how I don't even look at the total. Have you have you looked at his numbers lately? AD to see where uh, Roland is on the uh, no, yardage on the yardage chart. 
No, I have not. Uh, yeah. So any I'll, uh, while while I'm looking that up, tell me if there's any games or matchups that you are most intrigued by outside of, of course, our two championship games, and then I'll have some numbers on Chris Rowland by then. The game that intrigues me probably the most out of any of the games that we've talked about, Brian, is going to be the uh, uh, Alabama A&M Alcorn State. Be it not for the conference championship games, that would be our game of the week right there, Brian. You think that'd be the game of the week over uh, A&T and Bethune? Of, over the remaining games. Okay. Well, I, that's interesting. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna poo-poo it. It definitely uh, is uh, interesting. Um, so, Chris Rowland right now, in terms of all-purpose yards, is sitting at 1,949 all-purpose yards. Uh, on an average yards per game, it's 194.9, which is second. It's not in terms of just total yardage. It's number one. Uh, the only player that's close to him is the young man from Dayton, uh, but Chris Rowland is putting up numbers. And in terms of receptions, now this may be the last game of the year for Rowland. This will be game number eleven. I don't think they have. An, I'm not sure if they have another game. Chris Rowland has 10 recept or excuse me, in 10 games he has 92 receptions, 1289 yards, 7 touchdowns, a 9.2 receptions per game average. He is tied in first place with Jareth Stearns of Houston Baptist. He's a sophomore wide receiver. If you are aware of Houston Baptist, AD Houston Baptist, they're like uh the old Mike Le- they're, they're like Mike Leach's uh Texas Tech air raid system. I mean, they they just put the ball up. Actually, they have two two receivers in the top ten. That tells you about that offense. The fact that you have one guy who has 92 receptions for 757 yards. Think about look what I, think about what I just said there. 92 receptions, the same amount as Chris Rowland, the same receptions per game. But this young man Stearns only 757 yards, while Roland has 1,289. Isn't that something? Um, yeah, but there, there's another receiver for Houston Baptist who has 69 yard, uh, 69 receptions, and that young man has 10 touchdowns. But um, So we will be watching as we are on Chris Roland watch as well. Can he break 100? He's eight receptions away. And... You know, he is moving into Jaquay Nunnally and Jerry Rice status as one of the best receivers in the modern era in black college football. Is the sound fair to say? Uh, I would definitely I would definitely agree. We just hope that this young man gets his opportunity to show his skill at the next level. If not at the next level, then maybe in the XFL. Exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> that's um, that's really what we're watching for this upcoming weekend. You know, this is championship week, Brian, and we, uh, you know, we've talked to some championship coaches. There's one coach who has been left out of the championship for Ray, uh, be it that the conference told them that they would be ineligible to participate in the conference championship game this uh, particular year due to the fact that they cannot represent their conference in the NCAA tournament, and that is the Savannah State Tigers. And, Brian, I will give you all the credit in the world. You predicted this back during the summer when we started planning uh, shows for the upcoming season. You said the team to watch out for, AD is going to be Savannah State. You are high on their defense, and if you knew that new offense that they had was going to wreak havoc all over the SIAC, and it did, Brian. Savannah State won the East. 
Uh, hello, AD. Yeah, hey, I, I, well, I want to make sure I heard you. I put my headset down, ran to get a drink of water. I thought you were giving me some praise. Can you run that back one more time? I, you were saying <laughs> something about me being right. Is that what you were saying? I'm just Brian. Saying, you're gonna have to. I'm, you're gonna I'm have to hit rewind. <laughs> you're gonna have to hit rewind on that. Wait till you listen to the replay of this show. I got the time code on it, so I, I trust me. I marked that down. <laughs> we, we we might run that in a few promos. Yeah, uh, but I, I also want to give you credit on one other one. Uh, you you said Kentucky State also was going to be good this uh, this particular year. So uh, you, you were two for two on that, Brian. Well, thank you. You know, I, I will admit that, uh, again, Coach Quinn and Coach Jackson of Kentucky State, two coaches that uh, we were definitely uh, high on. I was personally high on just on the conversations. And uh, it, it's one of – I I think I've become a good listener to coaches who who get it. And I've listened to some coaches kind of – try to play coy and it, I don't know it's just one of those things that it's like a it's like a, a a radar it's like I can sense confidence I can sense common sense I can sense um a coach who has a plan and is doing it a certain way or sort of has an advantage over his peers I don't you know never lasts for long because everybody catches up but I just felt that those two those two men, because of who they were and what they were bringing to the table, were going to make a difference, you know. Uh, and so um, we say all that on a positive. I, I guess I can't I can't I was going to hold this back. Ad, we'll talk about it going into next week. But uh, the announcement did come out uh, a day from when we recorded this that Kevin Porter of Fort Valley State had been relieved of his duties uh, after four seasons, two appearances in the championship game of the SIC, a conference championship in, I believe, his first year. Um, they, he was let go. And... I don't we will find out more but all I'll say is my initial thought is that I wonder what not only last year would have been like but especially the end to this year would look like had there had he not lost quarterback Slade Jarman that's all I can say that's all I will say we will talk about it more next week yeah. uh and then of oh and then one other thing uh Sh- Shawan named a new coach. Remember Tim Place, who had been there for 12 seasons, he was placed, or he actually, uh, what what was, he actually stepped away for personal reasons, I guess? He, he, he just, yes. Yeah. yeah I think okay. that was the official statement. Yeah, he stepped away for personal reasons. He, he At that time, we didn't know whether he was going to be let go or whether this was something that he was going to try to come back. We really didn't know. Well, earlier this week, Shawan announced that the long time, his longtime assistant, who had been there for 12 seasons and with him, is now the head coach. And uh, uh, that um, uh, the, the coach's name uh, slips my mind right at the moment. But but anyway, uh, we'll we'll talk more about those coaching changes uh, next week. Uh, but okay, enough for me. Uh, any final? Oh, I had one other thing, but I won't. I won't do it. Anyway, any final thoughts there, Ad? No, uh, Brian. We 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 are in double overtime, and I'm looking up, and the kick is up, and it is good, Brian. Let's go home. <laughs> All right. Uh, one final shout out to I will say to Deshaun Wevington. Deshaun Wevington, uh, 1,377 yards on the season after putting up a 307-yard rushing performance in week number 11. Because of all the championship stuff and everything else going on, it was the most overlooked stat performance that I've ever seen. And, I mean, I, I just couldn't end the show without – talking or saying something about that he's just a sophomore folks 
uh, one of the best performances, and I'll explain later why that's one of the great performances in a season of great performances by Weathington. Uh, 307, one yard shy of the all-time mark, one yard shy. That's it. Now I'm done. Thank you, A.D. Drew, for everything you do and have done getting us uh, ready for this championship. Thanks for your interviews. Uh, we definitely appreciate Reginald Ruffin uh, for speaking with us, Coach Damon Wilson, and Coach Sean Quinn for taking time out of your schedules this week. Uh, and uh, that'll do it. Follow us on social media at MyBCSN number one. Find AD at BCSN Drew, D R E W. Find me on Twitter at DRB365. And follow us on Facebook the uh, HBC, uh, the uh, BCSN Sports Wrap Facebook page, the Black College Sports Network page, and on the web, we can be found at www.mybcsn.net. For A.D. Drew, I'm Brian Fulford. Good luck. Have fun. We will be watching the championship games, and we will talk with you next week when we have two new champions crowned, and we'll also know who is going to the playoffs in Division Two. Thank you. God bless. Peace out. Ahala. But you must be your heart.